This is Nesson, your New England Sports Network. Rhode Island in Kingston. Nesson presents Yankee Conference Football 86. Today, the Boston University Terriers take on the University of Rhode Island Rams. It's homecoming in Kingston and a lot of color in the stands. There is some uh, wind in the air which should cause some havoc for the passing game today. It should be about 50 degrees by game time, a sun-splashed afternoon. Hello, everyone. I'm Ken Bell. We're live at Mead Stadium. And glad you're with us for this showdown among two teams struggling, two teams needing respect, two teams needing a win. Rhode Island has not won, and BU has won just once. Former Patriots linebacker Steve King, you were in this situation back in 81 when the Patriots won just two games that season. You were looking for any kind of success you could have, and you needed a victory. Both these coaches face that situation today. It's very frustrating when you're in a situation like like this with the mid-season point so Bob Griffin first of all from the University of Rhode Island would like to get his first win in this season of course uh, right now they're winless and they're searching for ways to win they've had a lot of breakdowns uh, they've had moments where they played very well in ball games but it seems that they stopped themselves Ken they'll get a drive going some sort of breakdown it's really tough when you've come off back-to-back -back Yankee conference titles and have no success the following year of course Tom Earhart had something to do with that with his graduation. That's right. And, you know, talk about him graduating. They had 23 seniors graduate off that 85 squad. So uh, a real problem. But they have a very young ball club and a lot of talent there that I think will develop over the next two to three years. Now, BU's Steve Stetson felt his team was on the right track until until the last game against Richmond got blown out 56 to 15. Right. Prior to that, three weeks ago, a big upset went over the main Black Bears. And at that point, he and his coaching staff felt they were going in the right direction. But as you say, the following week against Richmond, blown out of the ball game. It was 28 to 15 going into the fourth quarter. Uh, Richmond scoring 28 unanswered points, blowing the Boston Terriers out of the ball game. And his coaching staff taking a step back, reevaluating, doing a little shifting today defensively. We should see Randy Pettis both at tailback and at fullback some. Will they throw more to him today, too? Well, I think they will. Uh, it looks like he's 100% now, bothered much by groin and, and hamstring pulls this year. If Randy Pettis is healthy and he's running the football, he can really be an asset to this team. And, of course, uh, I, I really believe they'd like to get him out of the backfield into pass patterns, much like Haynes is used by the Rams. Get Pettis that ball, let him get downfield and gain that yardage. On the other side of the ball, Doug Haynes, Mr. Everything, just one running back for uh, for the Rams, but he can do it all. He had 157 yards rushing against UMass and two touchdowns. That's right. And Ram, of course, a balanced attack. Two tight ends, one back in the backfield, that back being Doug Haynes. Doug Haynes fitting well into the scheme of things with the Rams. Bob Griffin likes to get him the football. He's that all-purpose type of back. Here we see him against the University of Massachusetts two weeks ago. Now watch. From his tailback position, flares out to the left. Now he cuts towards the sideline, Farland delivers the ball. He's gonna put on a move right here, makes a defender miss, walks into the end zone for the touchdown. And of course, running the ball, he's just as dangerous. And last week, or excuse me, two weeks ago, 19 carries, 157 yards against the Minutemen. Here, a simple play off the guard. He bounces off the tacklers. There you see that great balance he has. And once he gets in the clear, he turns on the speed and goes for his second touchdown in that ball game, leading the Rams to an early 17-0 lead. Bob Griffin says he wants to get him the ball more, passing and carrying the ball. But BU now is setting up a little de defensive front that may have something to say about that. A total reevaluation and a total new look on defense for Steve Stetson. Well, just, just what I talked about earlier, his staff reevaluating, and for this game, they're going to get more defensive backs into the ball game. They're going to move Carson, the outside linebacker, to defensive end. And they're going to bring two of the uh, defensive backs to outside linebacker covering the tight ends today to try to counter that strong passing attack that URI wants to emphasize. And, of course, uh, it'll look very uh, different out there today. It, it'll be unlike any defense we've seen the Terriers run before. So uh, we'll see how successful it is. Uh, and, of course, uh, big point, Brian Donfield will not be playing today, or at least it, it looks very doubtful that he'll start for the Rams. 
And uh, with that, uh, this defense could be very successful against the Rams. John Fields training the ankle two weeks ago. So from a 5-2 defense to a 4-4-3, we're going to see a lot of wild things today. And we'll have the opening kickoff right here on Nesson's Yankee Conference Football Game of the Week in just a moment. October is upon us, and with it comes the exciting action of Hockey East 86. Four great games open the season, and it all begins October 19th, when Lowell Chiefs travel to Providence and open against Mike McShane's Fire. On the 25th, Lowell will again take to the road, the lively Snively Arena, and the host UNH Wildcats. October 29th brings us two longtime rivals, the Northeastern Huskies and the Boston College Eagles. And Halloween night, we'll see the Maine Black Bears try to trick the defending champion BU Terriers. Hockey East is back with four great games in October. Hi everyone, I'm Bo Schumbeckler, football coach at Michigan. And I'm Jim Brandstatter. Join us each week this fall for Michigan Replay. Last year, the Wolverines surprised everybody with a 10-1-1 season and number two national ranking. They didn't surprise me. Well, you certainly surprised me. Well, surprising you certainly isn't a surprise to me. <laughs> for more of this and maybe even a surprise or two, join us each and every week right here on this station. Ken Bell with Steve King, Mead Stadium, as a few of the clouds now are shielding the sun, but it's otherwise a gorgeous afternoon for a football game. A little breezy here, which both teams planning to do a lot of passing today, so that may have some effect. The series history, Boston University leads 20 to 10. Last year, it was quite a shootout, 34 to 19 URI winning, and All-America quarterback Tom Earhart completed 32 of 63 passes for 326 yards, three touchdowns to lead the Rams to win in that one. The officials today, Robert Fee is the referee, Thomas McBride, Joseph Didi, then Philip Lapelier, Brian Sullivan, Mark McElhaney, and Harry Leckman is the clock operator. Those men officiating today. Glad you're with us for Nesson's Yankee Conference Football Game of the Week. The University of Rhode Island Rams will kick off to begin the ball game with Michael Griffin, the coach's son, Seeing the ball up, and Boston University set to receive BU with its only win on national television, ESPN, 34 to 14 several weeks ago. Uh, 26 to 23 was actually the score of that ball game. And now the Rams do the student body left routine as Griffin is set to kick it off, and now everybody comes back. We saw this a couple of times last year. It, unnerves the kickoff team just a little bit for BU. And now Griffin approaches the ball. And an end-over-ender which carries down to the 15-yard line taken by Randy Pettis at that point. And to the 27, Pettis out over the 30-yard line and out to the 33 where it's first down and 10 yards to go for Boston University. And now let's take a look at the Terriers offensively in this ball game. Starting at quarterback, Pat Mancini. The fullback is Tim Bunnell. Randy Pettis is the tailback. The tight end, Andy Wise. Ferreira, the flanker, and the split end is Gadboy. Across the front, Moylan, Bengston, Doyle, Tim, and Benko. And we'll talk about some adjustments that have happened up front for the BU Terriers for this ball game. People are moving across the line. The center is now playing guard. The guard playing tackle. Mancini wants to throw on first down, tucks it, and moves out to the 36-yard line. And a gain of about five yards. Taking a look at the... University of Rhode Island defense. All across the front, Jim Landry, John Gilman, and Phil Mulcahy. The linebackers, Kurtz, Richton, Happy, and Brown. And the defensive backs, Williams, the All-American candidate, Carbone, Adams, and Earl Smith. Second down, seven, a gain of three on the play. Pettis is the tailback, Bunnell is the fullback, and Pettis loses the football. It's still loose and fallen on by the Rams at the 34-yard line. The exchange was never made, and the Rams recover the football and take over at the 35. Well, here, Pettis never really gets a handle on the football. Now, watch this. Bill Brown has a shot at it, misses it, and then Kim Kurtz, number 31, comes in and recovers. So the Rams get the first break of the ball game at the 35-yard line, first and 10. Brett Farland, the quarterback, following in the steps of Tom Earhart, may have finally shaken off following that, having that hanging on your shoulders. Here's the pass to Jim Pratt. It 
He loses the football. It's incomplete. Pratt had it in his hands for just a moment and then dropped it. Looking at the URI offense, Farland at quarterback, Doug Haynes, the lone running back, the tight end, Brian Mitchell, Bob Donfield was to have started at wide receiver. Steve Potasik also to see some action over there. Donfield injured with an ankle problem. Jim Pratt and Steve Schwab are the other receivers. Kujawa, Levy, Palermo, Jansen, and Sellinger across that front line. Second down and 10. Farland calling the signals. Six foot junior, draw play, Haynes. Uh, there's that patented running move, the spinning, and look at that, all the way down to the 25 yard line for the first down. Just what we saw in the open. Well, they come out doing the same thing they started against the UMass Minutemen, the draw play to Haynes, and you can see when he breaks by that line of scrimmage, he's so dangerous. The Boston University defense with the new look, 4 4 3. And Steve will have you being an ex-linebacker with the Patriots take a closer look here and see exactly what they're trying to do as they set up. See, they split actually. They have two linebackers in, inside and then the two outside are about five yards deep. The handoff goes to Haynes up the middle and he moves to the 23-yard line. Interesting, Ken, they only have two linemen that are down in four-point stances. Four linebackers in there, uh, the two inside linebackers, of course, and the two outside people standing up. It looks like they're challenging the Rams to run against them. And, of course, the Rams working with that passing offensive formation, but Haynes has had a lot of success running the ball, 157 yards against UMass. Second down and seven. Farland to throw, near side. Pratt has got the ball, and he's knocked out of bounds at the 18. Jim Pratt, who came into the game with 16 catches for 210 yards and three touchdowns. We saw him make some circus catches two weeks ago against the Minutemen. Unbelievable tight roping the sidelines. Third down and three. Bob Griffin said that Greg Farland had his best week of practice so far this season, this past week. And of course, the Rams have had two to recover from the UMass loss. Drawing a bye last week. BU was also on. Farland pumps. Now lofts the ball for Pratt. He's out of bounds. Incomplete. Good coverage back there. And it brings up a fourth down. Well, Jackson really had position on Pratt. There was a little contact down there, but uh, probably uh, because Jackson had established his position, the official ruled it was not any type of interference. Mike Griffin will attempt the field goal. Ball to be spotted on the 25, making a 35-yard kick. And Griffin, so far this season, has a 37-yard field goal against UMass. He's two for three on the year. And this one is off to the left side, no good. Maybe the wind caught a little of it, but it looked like he hooked it also. Well, he did. He, he pulled that ball a little more than he wanted. And... Uh, you know, a barefooted kicker, let's watch him here, from the right, high, right hash, excuse me. Now watch, he, he just pulls that ball. He comes around a little too much. You can see he misses by about five feet there. After the Pettis fumble, the Rams cannot cash in, and now BU takes over first and 10 from their own 20-yard line. 12-51 remaining in a scoreless first quarter. Pat Mancini, the junior quarterback, sets the ball club. A lone setback is Bunnell. Mancini to throw. Pass is complete to Mark Ferrara, and he is out of bounds at the 27-yard line. Ferrara, the 5'10 senior, his 13th catch of the season. He now has 118 yards. Well, he lines up as a tight wing here. He's going to go about five or six yards down the field and just do an out pattern, a rollout by Mancini. He gets the ball there very quickly on the break. Second down and three. Pettis now in the backfield along with Bunnell as Mancini takes the two-step drop, fires the pass for Gatboy, pass is caught for the first down at the 36-yard line. BU just using the sideline, Steve, for the short yardage, but coming up with the first down there. Well, it appears that time Adams giving Gadboy, a lot of room out there in a zone coverage. Gadboy ran him up the field a little bit, broke it off at about 
eight or nine yards, got the ball and picked up the first down. And he has now caught one pass in 21 straight games for the Terriers. First and ten, Mancini pitch back to Pettis, cuts back, 45 and out of bounds. Pettis close to the first down and BU is fired up for this game. About a yard short, second and one. Well, it's interesting, they come out passing, Ken. They uh, set up a nice running play there, I think, for that passing. Uh, they loosen that ramp defense up a little bit, then the pitch to Pettis. And Pettis can be a big man today if he can continue to do that. Second at a yard at the 45-yard line. Randy Pettis had hamstring problems much of the season. Seems to be 100% today. That's Ferrara in motion, and the handoff to Pettis tries the right side this time. Good. Ram coverage at the 47, but I believe Pettis has got the first down. Ray Williams is the first man to greet him over there. And it is a first down. All right, here's the toss to the opposite side this time. Now watch, watch how they swing the play out here. Here comes Carbone. Now we're going to see, there you see Ray Williams coming up from the outside. He's got the contain, makes a nice hit. That was a nice play with the Ram defense. Ray Williams, a preseason All-American candidate by Football News. First down and 10 at the 48. Slot to the left, pitch comes to Pettis, and he is hit at the 50-yard line. Phil Mulcahy, he dragged him down from the backfield. Gain of two, second down and eight. Okay, he is a big character, 6'4", 270-pound senior. He came in with 45 tackles. You can make it 46 now and a definite pro prospect. He sure is. You know, he's got that potential to play in the pros. A lot of scouts giving him a look. Second down and eight yards to go as Mancini drops way back, now throws to the opposite side. The pass is caught by Pettis at the 50, 45, 40, and he dives down to the 38-yard line, and it's another first down. John Carbone makes the play back there, but not before Pettis has another BU first down, first penetration into Ram territory. Well, they're, they're getting the Pettis, they're getting the ball to Pettis in uh, various ways today. Here we see he's reversed his fielder. Originally, he rolled to his left, back to his right. This was the design play. You can see Pettis has Lyman in front of him. It's a screen executed extremely well by the Terriers. From the 39, first and 10, I formation, fake draw. Mancini wants to throw, ball tipped, and incomplete for Mancini. Or for uh, Pettis, I should say, at the 38-yard line. So the lineman, Jim Landry, got a big hand up in the air and batted the ball, just enough to throw Pettis off. Well, Landry with the heat there and uh, timed that well, got his hands up and broke that play up. Mancini had an open receiver, too. Mancini in his career has played with a punctured lung bruised ribs, had a concussion, a tough character out there. 6'3", 220 pound junior. Did not start the season, that belonged to Jim Schumann, but came in shortly after. And he rolls right, he is hit and brought down at the 38 yard line. John Gilman, the big freshman, makes the play. Now we saw him do this two weeks ago against the Minutemen. Gilman, with good lateral movement, down that line of scrimmage. Here, the fullback actually running a little wide. It wasn't a good fake. Gilman read it very well, got off of his blocker, slid down the line, and made the hit on Mancini. A couple of plays like that by a freshman, enough to really get you fired up for uh, the rest of the season. Emotional people anyway, freshmen. <laughs> Third down and nine. Ball just inside the 39. Mancini will be blindsided and sacked. Ball is intercepted at the 33-yard line by John Carbone. So Mancini made a mistake by throwing the ball after he had already been hit, and Carbone picks the ball up at the 34. Well, he had a blitzing linebacker, Jim Happy, hanging on to him. Let's take another look. Now, let's see. I believe Happy will come into your screen from the left right there. Now, watch. Mancini just trying to get the ball away, but Carbone has made his move from the safety position in front of Ferreira, the intended receiver. Here you see a good shot of a happy coming from the left side. Mancini actually should have pulled the ball down, made a bad choice there. Big turnover for the Rams. And Farland to throw on first down for Pratt, who has the ball, but out of bounds at the 46. Ball was just a little wide. Now, this is exactly what we saw Farland do, Steve, the last time we saw the, this team against UMass. 
throwing wide to the sidelines. And Pratt uh, catching a lot of those footballs on the sidelines there. That, that time the ball just a little bit too far. You can see he was trying to drag his toes, keep them in bounds, but the ball was too far away from him, pulling him away from the sideline out of bounds. Pratt wide to the near side as Farland set them up. Second down and 10. Draw play, Haynes. And this time, no running room. Greeted at the 35 by a number of white jerseys. Kevin Piggott, who now is playing outside linebacker. Third down and nine yards to go with 9.29 remaining in the first period. We're scoreless and the Rams facing a third down and nine. Marlin sets the team. And a throw over the middle. Pass is caught nicely by Steve Squad, who has the first down at the 43-yard line. Over the shoulder catch. All right, he slipped the secondary here. It appears to be used in a, in a zone defense. Two safeties taking their drops. Now Schwab takes that post pattern, splits that, that deep coverage, beats the underneath coverage, Farland with a nice pass, lays it out there beautifully, just over the underneath the defender, and in between the two deep defenders, there you can see him. 23 yards to the 42, draw play, Haynes, open at the 35, down to the 30 yard line, and the Rams on the roll, as Haynes picks up another first down. Well, this is exactly what we saw two weeks ago against the Minutemen early in the ball game. Here's a great view. There you can see the counter step. He sets up for the handoff. The draw actually gets some great blocking there. He has a lot of open room to the left side. Look at that move. Haynes is extremely dangerous once he gets downfield. Haynes has 28 yards so far in the ball game. First down and 10. Ball on the throw, being rushed, and locks the ball out there in a hurry, and it is incomplete. The pass intended for Steve Claypool, number 17. And that was Jim Mercer from his defensive end position, really putting the heat on Farland. Farland uh, just, he was back on his heels there, just dumping the ball off. Good coverage downfield by the Terriers as well. Rams have had trouble scoring, just averaging 12.4 points per ball game. BU hasn't had any more success than that. The Rams have had 21 turnovers and 14 interceptions, seven fumbles, 27 sacks. And the 0-5 record. Haynes goes left to the 25-yard line. And he is swarmed over by Keith McLaughlin, among others. Well, the second long situation, they want to come back with the draw, hoping that uh, BU is dropping into that zone defense. This time, McLaughlin, reading it very well, stays at home, slides to his right, and makes a nice tackle on Doug Haynes. Third down and six. Ball on the 26-yard line as Farland wants to throw again. Blitz is on. Left side incomplete, intended for Haynes. And Ken Clifford, with the safety blitz, was right there and made him throw much earlier than he wanted to. Well, it looked like he came off the guard tackle gap. Let's watch it here. Farland, the straight drop back. There you can see a Clifford coming free, blitzing from a safety position, as you said, Ken, and Farland without uh, the time really to set up and find a receiver. Fourth and six, Rams going for it from the 26. Griffin missed a field goal a moment ago on the last offensive drive. And now the Rams will try it on the fourth and sixth. Farland to the left side, looking out there for Steve Claypool, and the pass is incomplete. Batted away by Clifford again. No, this is Skip Jackson who makes the play, and BU takes over. Well, Jackson reacting very well. Farland rolling to the left. He's looking for Claypool around the sidelines, right at that first down marker, and the good reaction by Jackson bats the ball away. First to 10 BU, 7.39, remaining in a scoreless first quarter. We mentioned that the Rams were having trouble scoring this season. BU averaging just 11.8 points per ball game. The worst start in 11 years at 1-4 and four up at BU. Worst start in 11 years at URI. Pettis 
is swarmed over in the backfield. He'll lose a couple of yards on the play. Ken Kurtz and Jim Landry making the play. Kurtz is the red shirt junior that was a running back the first two years at URI. The strongest man on the team at 405 pounds on the bench. And it's second down and 11. This time, Gatboy comes wide to the near side, and they use Ferrara in the slot. Tight end is Andy Wise, number 82. Lone setback is Pettis. And the ball is lofted over the head of Mark Ferrara. And again, the Rams get the good rush on, and Mancini has to deliver the ball faster than he wanted to. And excellent coverage by the Rams secondary. They were in the man coverage there. Come on, Brett. Anthony Adams with a good coverage on Ferreira. Ferreira and Gadboy working from that slot position. Gadboy going inside Ferreira from the slot position, tried to run the out. And Adams had him covered very, very well. Third down and 11. Rams D doing the job so far on this offensive series for the Terriers as Gadboy again comes wide to the near side. Tony Winston is flanked to the right side. Number 24. Mancini gets the ball off in a hurry again, lofts it for Ferrara, and it's incomplete again. And what a rush the Rams are putting on. He just sees nothing but blue back there. Well, they come back with the same play. Again, Ferrara's in the slot. He tries to come off. Gadboy's moved to the inside, and Mancini's trying to loft the ball up high and let him run under it. But Paul Grenatel with the uh, good coverage from his safety position. Steve Jones, academically ineligible last year, is the team starting punter this year, averaging 38 yards on 35 kicks. Longest a 53-yarder, and he's prepared to punt the football at the 11-yard line. And Jim Pratt is the deep man standing at the Rams 43. A flag is in the air as Pratt takes the ball to the 48. A couple of markers are down. Pratt now to the 45 and out of bounds at the 42-yard line. But again, two penalty markers back here. Matter of fact, there are four across the field, decorated in yellow. Well, I believe Granitell did not get set properly. That's the first call. Let's watch it again here. On the punt. There we see the contact of the ball. Now, Ooh. now there's the contact, but it appears he was blocked into the punter, Ken. Ray Williams, head over heels and into the punter. And it will be a roughing call but what are the two penalty markers back here well as i said earlier i believe granitell had not set properly he was still moving from his outside position the ball was snapped but it appears that won't be called perhaps someone on bu had gone down the field too quickly or was it a uh... all right i I really felt that uh, Granatel was still moving. He was set up outside as a bullet to cover on that punt. Then he came back in, Ken, to the end position because the Rams had a 10-man uh, rush on. And it didn't appear he was set, but the officials do not call it. And the Terriers get a break. Well, this is interesting here. I thought it might have been an ineligible man downfield. Too fast, uh, leaving the line of scrimmage. Here's Randy Pettis. He carries to the... 47 yard line and picks up a good chunk of yardage. Gain of six, second and four. So the roughing the kicker penalty keeps the drive alive and Ray Williams, a victim of circumstance there, just knocked up into the air and back into the kicker. And maybe we'll get a chance to see that again. It looked as if he uh, was blocked into the uh, punter. Okay, here's the play. The pitch to Pettis moving to his left and Pettis moving well today. Now he gets outside right there, gets away from a tackler and picks up valuable yardage. Pettis tries the middle this time and is close to first down territory at the Ram 49-yard line. And it is a first down. Take a look at the punt play again, and here you see Steve Jones. All right, Williams will come barreling in here. Now, he's actually in a somersault. It appears he got hit by the fullback right there in the left corner of your screen. You see the fullback. If there was contact made, the official made an incorrect call. First and 10, nose deep inside the 50-yard line in the Ram territory as Mancini shots him out. Eye formation, pitch back to Pettis. He's been the workhorse so far today and a pickup of three yards. Now, when you talked with Steve Stetson earlier this week, Steve, he said they were going to try to spread out the wealth of the football. 
But they've stuck pretty much with Pettis so far. They really have. Uh, we suspected they would put the ball in the air more today. But I really didn't expect them to get the ball to Randy Pettis quite so much early on. So they're relying on him heavily today. And he's producing. Bob Griffin from the far sideline said his team has had a good week of practice. And ready for this ball game and needing some success, obviously, with an 0-5 record. Mancini rolls out. Here's the rush, the big rush. He throws back. And his receiver, Winston, catches the ball at the 27-yard line. Tony Winston turned around and had the sense of mind to receive the football after being hit. That may have been a pass interference call if he hadn't caught it. Well, what happens here is he's looking for Winston. Winston, it came in motion. Watch. Right away, he's looking for Winston, but the coverage is there. Now, he gets the heat. He's being ran out of the pocket. He throws the ball. Now, it's underthrown. Adams has good coverage on Winston, but he doesn't see that the ball's underthrown. Winston does. He turns back, gets the reception. A big play for the Terriers. Twenty-four yards on the reception. Four fifty-three remaining, and there you see Winston. And that look at look at his size. I mean, five six, one hundred fifty-eight pound senior. He's back there in the land of the Giants, getting the job done. And next to Andy Wise, his tight end, who is six four, two twenty-seven. That's quite a size differential. <laughs> well, he makes up for that lack of size with great speed and a, and good moves. He has that ability uh, to get upfield and with that speed make his cuts and get open. Bob Griffin, his 11th season at URI, back-to-back -back Yankee Conference titles. Of course, he lost all of his outstanding receivers except Bob Donfield, who now is injured and unable to play. Brian Forster will be back next year. Brooks said, hey, we'll take a year off and work on your studies, big guy. And of course, DiMaggio, Riley, Earhart, all disappearing from the team. That's a heck of a loss. So Farland has tried to pick up the pieces, and Bob Griffin felt that in the last week, he sensed that maybe Greg has put all that excess baggage down of trying to live in Earhart's shadow and really began to assert himself. But right now, it's BU asserting itself as Pettis takes the football and moves it to the 25-yard line. So he's got another five yards. Jim Happy, the linebacker, makes the play. Now, this is interesting. Benston, the left guard, is off the line of scrimmage quite a bit. He's tipping the play when he's like that. When he sets back further than the other offensive lineman, he's tipping the defense. He's going to be pulling. Bengston moved over from center for this game. He started at center all season. Chris Doyle, the freshman, moved into center. Now, here it is again. Look at Bengston's alignment at left guard. See how far back he is? Let's see if he pulls this time. And Cini to loft the football, and the pass is hot, but out of bounds and incomplete. David Snowball, who is or was the backup quarterback and had a shoulder problem coming into this game, the intended receiver. Here is Snowball. All right, let's take a look at him here. Off the line of scrimmage. Now, it's a stop and go. Mancini's going to lay the ball up. He has to look back over the opposite shoulder just a little bit too far. Carried out of bounds. Third down and seven. High formation. Mancini to throw. Right side, and... The pass is dropped. That time, Snowball again. He was open, but when he was hit, he dropped the football. Well, Williams was beaten on the play. Mancini just a little late delivering the football. Gave Williams the time to get back in there and break it up. Here he is rolling to his right. He gets great blocking, plenty of time. Now he sees Snowball, but a little late. Now he delivers the ball a little behind Snowball. It allows Williams time to react, come back, and break it up. Great play by Ray Williams. Dan Green will attempt the field goal from the 34. This is a 44-yard kick. Green, 5 for 7 in field goals this year. He has a 47-yarder, his longest. This is a 44-yarder. It's a low liner and off to the side, no good. And short. Combine all those things together and you have a miss. <laughs> <laughs> Never made it. Uh, well, both these teams starting out, they're moving the ball, Ken. But as we talked earlier, the breakdowns come. Here are the field goal attempt, and this is never close. He doesn't get a good piece of it. Okay. Kicked very low. So we're still scoreless with four minutes remaining in the first period. Now, both these teams have had turnover problems, penalties, all sorts of problems. But and then you've seen a few of those so far in the first period. But actually, both of them playing pretty well. 
Well, they are. You know, they're moving the football. We've seen a lot of action. They're both throwing the ball. And that can provide for a very exciting football game. Now on first down, Farland drops back into the pocket and throws the ball. And he has his man, Jim Muse, out to the 42-yard line. So Muse goes for 22 on the pass reception before Cook can make the play. Well, Cook defending on the play, and Muse doing a nice job getting open. Farland seeing him very well. That's a beautiful pass over Cook. Muse goes up and gets it. That's what Greg Farland has to do today. He has to deliver the ball like that. He has to split that seam between the underneath coverage and the people deep. And he has said, Farland has said, that the big plays have been there. He just hasn't made them. Here's the handoff to Haynes, and he'll get no gain on the play. But Farland certainly making a, a nice pass there and showing some signs. Keith McLaughlin wrapping up Haynes, and there you see Steve Stetson on the sideline talking things over with his offensive front line. We're going to try to feel that guy. Is that guy crossing the bank on the base? He's going to take with And Bob Griffin on the other side. You've got a, a center playing guard. You have the guard playing tackle and a freshman moving into the center spot. So you have a revamped line, and I'm sure there are a lot of adjustments going on on the BU bench. Carlin to throw the bomb. He's looking down for Pratt, the speedster, and the pass is incomplete. Jim Pratt, the fastest man on the team, still couldn't catch up with that one. Runs the 4-5-40. So it all comes back now, and it's a third down and 10. Trying to run the goal pattern. They wanted it all on that play. Ball just overthrown. Most receivers wouldn't have gotten even that close, Ken. Uh, Pratt with exceptional speed for a wide receiver. Homecoming crowd enjoying the nice day here at Mead Stadium. Watching the Rams face a third and ten. Two-step drop, pass to the left side, complete to Pratt, and he is tied up for a moment and then falls backward to the 48-yard line. And Skip Jackson makes the stop from his cornerback spot. Well, this is interesting. They've got the third and ten situation. BU back in that zone, the corner Jackson giving Pratt a lot of room. He knows he has great speed. He runs about a five-yard pattern, turns up, gets the ball. Now he has a lot of room to the inside right there and struggles for that first down. It's going to be very close. And they'll bring the chains across the field to spot it. And there you have a good tight shot of the football, which is resting on about the 48-yard line. Well, you know, I think they're going to rely heavily on Pratt today, Ken, of course, with Donfield not playing. He should be the primary receiver for Greg Farland. Don Field on the sideline, the, obviously the best receiver on the team, and the fourth leading receiver in Rams history. Had the ankle sprain the last catch of the ball game against UMass. It was tender for the week following, and then last week he tried to practice on it on Tuesday, had it heavily taped, just couldn't do it. It was too tender. He had a great, great game uh, two oh, weeks sure ago did. when we saw him play the... Uh, UMass team and uh, something like eight or nine catches for 112 yards. Yeah, he had a couple of circus catches in that ball game too. Several of the Rams receivers had phenomenal catches in that ball game. Fourth down and six inches. They put fourth and zero on the scoreboard. It's so close. Long count. Hoping to draw someone off sides. Hand off Haynes. He should have the first down as he moves it to the 47 yard line. Looks like he has the six or eight. He may have had a yard, Steve, so that should be another first down. It is. Next week, Steve and I will be watching UMass and BU play football from Boston University, Nickerson Field. UMass is playing Maine today. That should be a good ball game. 221 remaining in this one. It's scoreless and has been very entertaining so far. Greg Farland, the junior quarterback, into the pocket. Throws to the near side, looking for Pratt. He is hung up out there, and the pass is incomplete. Nice defensive play by Mark Seals. And they've been all over Pratt. Well, Seals just, he was on uh, Pratt like flypaper here. The straight drop back. Farland wants Pratt all the way. He's going for him, but Seals, you're going to see, he's right in Pratt's hip pocket. Great coverage. Forces Farland to overthrow. Second down and 10. Ball just outside the 47. There you see the defensive alignment. 
The linebacker's about five yards, six yards off the line of scrimmage. Farland out of the backfield, hit Haynes, but Haynes can't hang on to it, right through his hands. And incomplete. And uh, it was Cook. Ricky Cook defending on the play. Defending on the play. Third and ten. Well, well this Haynes time, was there, but I think he turned around and saw right, someone in his right. face. Right, the Terriers having no one on them as he released. They were in the zone coverage. The Cook's going to react, but Haynes had plenty of time. He just misses the football. Third down and ten. It's been one of the problems the Rams have had all season, drop footballs on the passes. Ball on the throw again. Oh, he hit, kept away. Now throws the ball for Haynes. He hangs on this time, but is hit down hard by Ricky Cook at the 46-yard line and no game. <laughs> this is amazing. It appeared good Kevin Murphy had Farland for the sack. Somehow, Farland shakes loose. A straight drop back. Here you see Murphy coming in fast. Now he ducks him right there. But watch, Murphy trying to grab him around the legs. Farland somehow gets the ball away. And a great catch by Doug Haynes. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fourth down. Here's the punter, Tom Centauri. 5'11", junior, five punts. And an average of 29 yards. As long as the 41-yarder. But look at this one. A beauty. And lands on the six-yard line. Coverage down there, and it's down to the one. Centauri, who averages 29 yards on the punt, gets off a boomer, and they'll spot the ball at the two. And downing it is one of the Rams on the special teams. Steve Schwab, the tight end. There's Centauri. Boy, what a boomer that was. That was a beautiful punt, and he got such a nice roll on it. It, when it hit, did not go straight into the end zone, sort of uh, angled off toward the side, and Muse with great, or excuse me, Steve Schwab with great coverage. A 45-yard kick for Centauri. BU operating down in no-mistake territory. Mancini wants to throw over the middle, and Snowball slips down at the 30-yard line, and it's incomplete. Well, Steve Stetson's upset about this one. Snowball split that two-deep coverage that uh, URI had, and he was wide open. Mancini just underthrows the football. That could have been a big play. If he had hit Snowball in stride, he could have very, went, very well went all the way for a touchdown. You saw the offensive coordinator sending in the signal, and Mancini relates it to the team, and now second down and ten. Here's the play from the two-yard line. Pettis, and he's wrapped up, maybe a yard on the gain at the most. On the play, Ken Kurtz, the defensive end, and it brings up third down and eight. He gets two on the play. Kind of a surprise to see them come out and throw the ball in first down. A gutsy call, and it was there, but uh, his receiver, Snowball, had slipped down. Now they go with Pettis, and now face a third and long, Steve. What if they have to throw it here? 35 seconds remaining in the first period. We're scoreless. Mancini into the pocket. Throws to the right side. Pass is caught, but out of bounds at around the 10-yard line. It's Randy Pettis on the reception. And it brings up a fourth and one. Fourth and two. Well, again, they want to get the ball to Randy Pettis. The Rams in a zone coverage, of course, with the third and long. Laying back, Ray Williams reacting, coming up and driving Pettis out of bounds after he made that reception. Steve Jones, who was roughed up the last time he punted the football and the drive stayed alive for the Terriers, kicks from his own end zone. The rush is on, and he is hit again. That will be another roughing call as the ball is taken at the 21-yard line by Boyer and we turn to the 35, but Anthony Adams, the cornerback, rushing in, runs into Steve Jones, does not get a piece of the football, and another 15-yard walk-off. Well, this is definitely roughing on this play. You're going to see Adams come into your screen from the right, right there. Just misses the angle, but gets the leg of Jones, and that's definitely roughing. This time, there's no question there... That was uh, that was roughing. On the last call, Ken, I really felt the official missed the contact the pullback made on Williams. 
this time uh, it's really obvious, no doubt. 14 seconds remaining in the period. First and 10 BU with new life again following another roughing penalty. Pitch to Pettis, tries to reverse his field and he will be snowed under at the 22 yard line by Ken Kurtz. Well it looked like he had an open hole here, but Mulcahy with that great ability had been blocked down on the ground. He comes up here, here you see it, the toss to Pettis. Watch it, Mulcahy right there, sheds the blocker. He's got Pettis around the ankles, but Pettis with that great ability gets away, but good, good pursuit by Mulcahy's teammate, John Gilman in on that tackle. That is the end of the first quarter. Scoreless at Kingston and Meade Stadium will return with a second period of play on Nesson's Nation Conference Game of the Week in just a moment. Nineteen eighty six will long be remembered as one of the greatest years in Red Sox history, and we here at Nesson are proud to have been part of it. From Roger Clemens' twenty strikeout performance to the title clincher, this season has been full of unforgettable moments. To preserve these memories, we will send you, our subscriber, the Boston Red Sox nineteen eighty six championship souvenir book. To receive the publication, simply remain a Nesson subscriber until November. We'll mail it right to your home. We hope you enjoy our gift. Ken Bell, Steve King set to go with second quarter action. And an incomplete pass by Mancini starts off the second period. Now we need to tell you that instead of Snowball, which we thought was number seven, it is actually Gadboy who came out as number four, but his jersey was ripped off. And so he's had to say, hey, Snowball, since you have a shoulder injury and can't play, give me that jersey. Well, it sounds like the equipment manager forgot to pack extra jerseys. <laughs> So there's Dennis Gadboy, the outstanding receiver, a center fielder in baseball at BU. Caught one pass down in 21 straight games with his reception here today. Second down and 10, Mancini to throw. The bomb, looking down, it is intercepted at the 45-yard line, back to the 50, and it, Paul Granadell returns the ball to the 42-yard line. All right, Farland, excuse me, Mancini, one in Ferreira on the post pattern deep. Granatel from his safety position plays it perfectly. Now the ball is underthrown, but it was good coverage by Granatel. He had perfect position. There you can see him. He reads it. It's underthrown in front of the intended receiver Ferreira. The turnover for the Rams. Now he's going to get upfield, pick up a few blockers, get about 10 or 15 yards. From the 42, Farland to throw the bomb, looking for Pratt, and it's incomplete. Seals was back defending on the play. Pratt put on the burst of speed, but the ball was thrown too far inside. Well, there was one man uh, that should want a receiver like Pratt with Pratt's great speed on this Terrier team, it would be Mark Seals. There's Pat Mancini on the sideline getting a little oxygen and regrouping the troops. Second down and 10, 14.40 remaining in the second period. We're scoreless here at Meade Stadium, Rams and BU Terriers. Long count by Farland, throws quickly to Schwab. He's inside the 35 yard line down to the 33. Steve Schwab, his big 6'2", 220 pound target, makes his first reception of the afternoon. All right, let's watch it. Looking to his right, it appeared he wanted Muse all the way. Muse just turning up inside that zone, gets the reception, picks up five extra and the first down, or close to the first down. And they'll bring the chains in to take a look. The only common opponent between these two teams is Maine. BU beat Maine 26 to 23. UI lost 34 to 14 earlier this season. Really a rough ride for BU against Richmond. Four first downs, 
in the first with three minutes left in the half. It was 28 to 15, and then Richmond four touchdowns in 10 minutes. Stetson obviously upset, hoping to see his team rebound today, and so far they've played well. And it's just about six inches short of a first down, so it'll be third and about six inches. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Ken Bell and Steve King, former Patriots linebacker, on hand to watch this one. We've seen the BU defense shift into a 4-4-3, something they haven't done all season, but it's been pretty effective so far. Well, it's slowed this Ram offense down somewhat. We'll see what Farland can do here on third and short. And the handoff to Haynes, puts his head down, pushes his way for the first down. Doug Haynes, the redshirt sophomore, fractured a collarbone against Furman last year in the playoff game. Came in with 259 yard rushing on 40, 45 carries, three touchdowns, and had another 219 yards through the air. Gets another first down here for the Rams. Puts me in mind of a ball player we saw last week on the Delaware team, Bob Norris. Doug Haynes, much like him, that all-purpose type of player. Fourth in the nation, all-purpose. Averaging 183.6 yards per game. 918 total yards. So Doug Haynes, a definite threat. Farland this time throws to the right side. The pass is almost picked off. Incomplete. Pratt was on the go pattern, Steve. Somebody missed well, the communication there. I, it, it appeared that Farland had called an audible. He read the blitz. There was definitely a blitz coming from the back side. And I believe Pratt missed the audible call. He was on the go pattern all the way. Second down and 10 from the 32 as Farland checks in at the sideline and brings the play in. Pratt now splits wide to the far side. Steve Claypool is the split man near. Tight ends are Schwab and Brian Mitchell, former basketball player at URI. Farland, throw over the middle, Schwab, and he has the ball at the 32-yard line. That brings up a third down. So the Rams just choosing to go for short chunks of yardage here and leaving them now with a third down and six. Will BU willing to give them that uh, short pass? Views just cutting it as outside as Pratt ran upfield trying to run the corner off. Third down, Farland to throw, blitz is on. Lops the ball, pass will be picked off and incomplete. Well, that's the second one that Skip Jackson has had a shot at, and this one he flatly drops. Well, Jack Reibel blitzing from his inside linebacker position responsible for this play. Now watch him. To the left there, comes right over the guard tackle gap, right in Farland's face. Farland has to release the ball early. And almost an interception. Fourth down and six, and the Rams going for it again. Second and fourth down play they've got on. Farland sees something on defense he doesn't like and says, let's talk about it. Well, again, they're in that fourth down situation. They're inside the 30-yard line. They might as well go for it. Of course, uh, these two teams, one winless and one at one and four, in this situation today, Ken, uh, I think we'll definitely see them going for it on fourth down. Steve Stetson on the sideline talking with, I believe that's Jack Reibold, the inside Reibold, linebacker, right. who was responsible for that uh, great blitz in that last play. Homecoming here at URI. A lot of festivities this weekend, and the beach balls are up in the air, reminiscent of Fenway Park. Everybody's got the fever here. There's the Ram mascot, who is probably the warmest thing on the field today, right? <laughs> I wish I had that on right now. I'll tell you, we got a little, little wind coming in, some cloud cover, and it's getting chilly. But it's football weather when it's like that. Absolutely. Fourth down and six. And now the play has been called, and Farland brings him up. Ball is at the 27-yard line. Haynes is the lone setback, and now Farland to throw, 
He has Pratt on the sideline, and he's got it at the 18-yard line. This is a great catch by Jim Pratt. Now, Rybold, the inside linebacker, is on the blitz again. Farland dropping back, excuse me, rolling to his right. Pratt right on the sidelines. Watch him get the ball now. Watch him get those feet down before he's driven out of bounds. Farland is 8 for 17, 77 yards passing so far, and Pratt has three of those, 22 yards. And now the Rams with a first and 10 at the 18-yard line as Farland drops back to throw again. Quick release, and the pass is overthrown, intended for Steve Claypool as 5'10 sophomore. Well, this time, the other inside linebacker, McLaughlin, coming hard on the blitz. Farland not having any time to find his receiver, just has to dump it off, hope that Claypool can run underneath the ball. That was a nice, nice job by McLaughlin, uh, really hit that hole quickly as the ball would snap, disguise the blitz well. EU defense is doing the job here. Second down and 10. Draw play, Haynes wrapped up behind the line at the 21 yard line. Vince Jackson is there, helped out with a couple of his teammates. Also in there is Kevin Murphy, defensive tackle. Well, this time they were hoping to catch BU blitzing, come with the draw, and break Haynes by the line of scrimmage. But the Terriers reacting very well, especially the linebackers McLaughlin and Rybolt closing that hole up and getting help from the inside people. Third down, 12. 12-19 12 remaining in a scoreless ball in a scoreless first half, I should say, as Farland rolls. Lofts the ball, and it is topped by Schwab. No, it's intercepted. Schwab was right there. The pass is picked off by Ricky Cook. Make it Skip Jackson, number 27, who picks it off. Skip, the happiest man on the field now. It looked like Schwab had his hands on the ball. Well, this is anybody's football. Jackson there, but it appeared that Schwab might come down with it. There's the pass. Now look at this. Watch it. It appears that Schwab is going to catch it. Jackson comes in, takes the ball away from him. That's a beautiful play by Jackson. BU wards off another attempt by the Rams. And now facing a first and 10 from their own 20-yard line. Go back on offense. Here's Pettis. He's open. Out to the 30-yard line. Has the first at the 32. Pettis found good yardage there before John Claiborne could get to him in the backfield. We saw just a hint of the burst of speed that Pettis can put on there before he gets into that defensive secondary. Allows him to spring it. John Carbone saved a, a touchdown. Mancini the pitch again to Pettis. This time no running room. Ray Williams is there along with Ken Kurtz. And it sets up a second down, a loss of a yard at least. And that time, Ken, John Gilman, again, the freshman, shed his block very well. The hole was intended to come earlier, uh, but Gilman sliding down the line forced Pettis to the outside. And, of course, Williams coming up from the outside making the tackle. Second down, 11. Ball at the 30. High formation, Tim Bunnell is the fullback. Big draw. There's the bomb. Looking downfield for Tony Winston. It is incomplete. And again, it's Ray Williams defending on the play. Winston has got some speed, but Williams was right on him. All right, Mancini back here. He's going to get some pressure. The linebacker blitzing. He's going to pay the price if he releases the football. There you see he's hit. Williams with excellent coverage on Winston. And that height advantage as well. There you see him breaking it up at the sideline. BU has averaged 155 yards through the air and just 96 yards rushing so far this season. Pettis so far at three yards rushing. It's third down and 11, and maybe too much time on this one. And it is delay of game. Another one of those wonderful penalties that coaches love to see. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on, come on. 
the breakdown. So frustrating. See, Especially when you're going through seasons like these two teams exactly. have gone through. Well, when you played on the 81 Patriots team, Earhart's team up there, and uh, went 2-14, and 14, was it? Exactly. <laughs> I don't like to recall it. No, though. no, you <laughs> tried to forget it, right? But it seems yeah. like everything goes wrong. It's just, uh, it, it's kind of a comedy of errors. Things pile up. Third and 16 here. He wants to throw plenty of protection. He'll run with it now. 30, 35, 40. Out of bounds at the 40. Did he get the first down? Well, this is it. It's going to say if he could get the first down, he'd be kicking himself. Well, he does a nice job here. He, he, he gets a little help from uh, Gadboy downfield. Now, what's this? Gadboy's going to cut over the middle. Now, look at the crowd he draws. All right. Now they see Mancini <laughs> running out <laughs> of the pocket. It's a little too late. He picks up the first down. From the 42. There's a tight slot on the left side. Here's the pitch coming to Gadboy. End around. Good block out here. Ray Williams stays with it. Now Gadboy turns the corner and is stepped out of bounds to the 41-yard line. Well, a well-designed, a well-run play by BU and a great block thrown out there, Steve. All right. Here it is. The fake to Pettis. The pitch reverse to Gadboy. Now he's going to get a good block from number 70, John Kim, on Ray Williams. Williams, though, not keeping proper leverage. Gadboy turns on the speed, gets to the outside. A well-executed play by Boston University. John Tim making that happen. The 6'2", 239-pound sophomore guard. Number 70. First and 10, 41. Pettis to the handoff. Inside the 35, breaks it to the 25, the 20, and is down at the 19. Ray Williams wrestles him down but not before he picks up another good chunk of yardage, 20 yards on the play. And give Peter Bankston, the offensive guard, credit. He makes a key block that springs Pettis. Once Pettis hits that hole created by Bankston and the other lineman, he turns on the Jets. Now watch it. Watch Bankston pull around. Bam, right there. He opens up that lane. Pettis also has a lead blocker in number 63. Mark Moylan gets downfield with nice running ability and picks up the big first down for BU. 21-yard play, Pettis now with 54 yards. Hand off Tim Bunnell, first carry of the afternoon, and he has a yard, maybe. Down to the 18-yard line, the big fullback. The big freshman there, Gilman again, Tim. Gilman's having himself a day to remember. 10 minutes remaining in the scoreless first half. Both teams moving, both teams threatening, both self-destructing. Well, Gary Pettis has to be gaining confidence by what's happened early here. This is probably as effective as he's run all season. Gatboy to the near side, Ferrara to the right, or to the far side, I should say, with Bunnell and Pettis back there, and Pettis with the pitch. Nice block as Pettis tries to turn the corner. Cannot. Got a lot of help from Peter Bengston in the backfield to spring him for a couple of yards. Here comes Pettis out of the ball game. Again, he's holding his right arm. Ooh. Pettis, really, uh, one of those guys, tough luck, really prone to injury, uh, having a well of a time last year dealing with those injuries. And uh, this year, the leg problems, the pools, the groin and hamstring. Separated shoulder, bruised ribs, concussion last year. This year, the hamstring problems. Mancini to throw to Gadboy, and he is bumped out of bounds as he reaches the 13-yard line. Ray Williams again making the defensive play. That'll leave him short of a first down. So it brings up fourth and three. Mancini turns to the bench and says, what's the play? Well, these teams going for field goals early, both of them unsuccessful, and they're going to go for it on fourth down now. Fourth and three. Mancini to throw for it. Puts the ball. It is incomplete. Will a flag come out? No. Ray Williams. Nice defensive work on Gadboy. He was right with him all the way. I couldn't tell how much contact there was on the play. 
Well, the second play in a row where Williams makes a nice play. Now the ball's underthrown here. He doesn't throw the ball soon enough, see? The receiver has to come back for it, but Williams with the good coverage. No interference there, just uh, great coverage by Williams. He was on top, literally on top of Gadboy. Absolutely. Rams take over, having held off the Terriers again. First and 10 from their own 13. Farland the drop, being hit as he releases. Pass is caught by Jim Muse, who moves it out to the 30-yard line. There's some breathing room for you. Muse was wide open on that play. It looked like he came from the right side right uh, side from the tight end position crossing now look how wide open he is Ken he gets the ball a trailing linebacker there but he's six or seven yards back Skip Jackson finally makes the stop but not before he picks up the first at the 30 yard line 830 remaining scoreless first half a lot of teams showing a lot offensively between the 20s Farland to throw to the right side. Haynes out of the backfield has it. 35 spins around 40 and is down at the 41 yard line. Ball is loose. And the Terriers have it. We're going into this ball game. The Rams were minus 11 in turnover ratio, Ken. Now they're minus 12. And it appears that Doug Haynes, after a, a reception and a great move, Here's the pass from Farley. Now watch him make McLaughlin miss. He spins upfield here. Now right there, it appears Mark Seals grabbed his right arm and raked the ball away. Ricky Cook, number 35, recovers. And that's a key turnover for the Terriers after missing a fourth and three a few plays ago. Gray hairs on both sidelines for these coaches today, I'll tell you. Here's Vince Jackson out of the backfield. Look at this move. Down to the 33-yard line. And this guy's a freshman too, Ken. 5'7", <laughs> 168. A lot of freshmen playing today for these two teams. As we mentioned, they're young teams, really. A lot of uh, young people, a lot of freshmen out there today. It well, looks like Pettis won't be back. The Terriers, on their starting 22, seven seniors, six juniors, three freshmen, and six sophomores. Very young. And backup, six sophomores and six freshmen. Second down and a yard as Mancini wants to throw for it. Gadboy has it at the 25-yard line, brought down by Ray Williams at that point, but he has the first down. Well, this time, this time Gadboy wins the battle. He starts out, seals backing up. Backpedaling in the zone. Now he has to react as Gadboy turns up. Good timing, Mancini delivering the ball promptly as he turned it up. That one goes to Gadboy. Mancini having trouble through the air. Seven for 19 and 70 yards so far in the ball game, but they're making the pass count. Mancini wants to throw. Looking down the sideline, and Gadboy is out of bounds. A penalty marker is down at the 24. Seven minutes left in the half, and a holding call is coming up against the Terriers. And there it is, another penalty. The Rams will elect to uh, take them back here, put them in a very long yarded situation on first down. Rather than a second 10, they elect to put it in the uh, first and 20 situation. All right, rolling to the right here. Let's watch Jackson, number 20, right there. There you see it. He's got his arm around the, Whoops. the defender. A little flagrant. Yeah, I'd say that's probably an easy one to spot. We see Pettis on the sidelines. Can I probably spoke too soon? Uh, he's behind Coach Stetson. He should be available. He came off a moment ago holding the arm. Now Mancini wants to use his arm. Gets the ball off just as he's hit. Vince Jackson, 30-yard line, cuts back 25. Look at this. 10, 5, Jackson scores. Vince Jackson, a 36-yard touchdown play. Well, this play is designed to go to the right. 
but the key is Mancini going to his left, drawing the linebacker. See how the linebacker is going to be influenced now? Now watch, he turns around, the lineman is set up. You can see the lineman sliding over in front of Jackson. Well executed, now he's going to get some blocks there. There's Tim with a block. Inside of that block, turns on the speed, breaks a tackle by Williams, turns it on, touchdown, BU. Dan Green will attempt to tag on the extra point. On the tee, up and good. 6.49 remaining in the first half, and BU has struck first, seven to nothing. Well, we saw them run the same play in the first quarter. Pettis in the ball game at the time. That play was ex executed extremely well, and this time, Jackson, the receiver there, you can see it influencing people to the right, turning back, the lineman setting up, he gets great blocks, him with the last block on Williams, inside move there, he gets another block from the receiver, and it's down the sideline for the Terriers' first score. That's one to remember for the freshman. And <laughs> I'll tell you what, Steve Stetson's got something to build on here with so many young people out there. And you take Pettis out of the ball game and you can turn to a, a Vince Jackson, you don't give up any speed at all. And Pettis was having a fine ball game until he went out. And you bring the freshman in, you're, you're perhaps thinking, uh, boy, I've got a young ball player out there. I hope that he can fill those shoes. And he comes in and performs beautifully. Number two, Green to kick off. And responsible for the Terriers getting on the board first. 36-yard touchdown play. Both teams had threatened up to that point, but nobody had been able to put it in, either killing a drive with a fumble or a missed fourth down situation. Now with 6.49 remaining in the first half, it's 7-0. Dan Green boots the ball, and it's carrying down the Poirier at the 20-yard line. 30, 35, nice return out to the 37-yard line. Chris Boyer, the 5'10", 186-pound freshman, shows a burst of speed of his own. And the Rams now facing the final 644 of the first half, hoping to get some points on the board. Scoring drive went five plays, 41 yards, and consuming 122 off the clock. Thirty-seven yard line, first and ten. Farland sets them up. Throw and waits for Haynes. 45 out to the 47. Still on his feet. Boy, is he tough to bring down. Well, Dennis Carson, the defensive end, actually had coverage on Haynes. He jumped on him early. Haynes coming out of the backfield. It looks like Jim Pratt's shaking up there. He's going off the sideline. But uh, a nice move by Haynes. Farland read it well. Carson with the tight coverage. Haynes broke downfield. Farland delivering the football. That was uh, a good job between Farland and Haynes of recognizing what was going on. Carson goes to the sideline where he's discussing things. And it's a first down at the 47 yard line. Six and a half remaining first half. BU just scoring on the 36 yard touchdown play. Farland, Schwab, 50 down to the 48. Steve Schwab picks up five. Well, the Rams showing some life on offense here with Farland completing the pass again. That play's been uh, very effective for them in the ballgame. Schwab just getting upfield about five or six yards, turning it outside. Farland rolling that direction and uh, getting the ball to him quickly. Now 12 for 23, 120 yards in the afternoon for Farland. Wants to throw again. Quick pass. And it is caught and some extra running room by Steve Potasic down to the 30-yard line. And penalty markers fly at that point. May tag on some yardage here. Well, let's watch it. Potasic, watch the move after he catches the ball. Farland really throws a bullet to the inside move there, away from his man, and Rybol, the inside linebacker, a little stiff arm there. Now, the thing you should notice here with Potasic, did you notice, Kennedy, he cut back inside, he switched the ball as he saw the defender coming up. He's carrying it on his left side, he switched it to the right. Face mask penalty against BU, and you can mark off another five. Ball is on the 25, first and 10. Potasic 
the spark plug here on this drive. Farland, pump fake, now lofts the ball for Pratt. It is batted away incomplete. Skip Jackson was back defending on the play. He's used that play a lot, just trying to loft the ball and hope that Pratt, the fastest man on the team, can run under it. And he was rushed a little bit again. The Terriers coming with both inside linebackers on the blitz up the middle. So Farland really having to throw off of his heels quite a lot today and just laying that ball up, hoping that Pratt could get under it. Bob Griffin surveys the situation. His offense trying to move here. Second down and 10 from the 25. Farland dropped. Here's the screen. Haynes cuts back 25, 20, down to the 17. Haynes finds himself about two yards short of the first down, bringing up a third. Well, the Rams come back with a screen of their own. All right. Here it is. Setting up, flaring out there. Now, what you make McLaughlin miss? Inside move there. Gets upfield, gets some blocks from his lineman. Nice job by Doug Haynes. Third down, two. Big draw. Harlan will keep. 15. Out of bounds at the 12, and first down. Quarterback bootleg all the way, and reminiscent of Steve Grogan going for a touchdown <laughs> against the Jets last year. Well, this is a smart play. They know that they're being influenced. The linebackers are being influenced by Haynes' action. The linebackers went with them. Farland pulls the ball, puts it on his hip for a second, runs around the corner for the first down. From the 11-yard line. And the Rams take time to figure it out as Farland goes to the far sideline. Next week, Steve and I will be watching the BU UMass game, Nickerson Field. Seven to nothing. The BU Terriers lead here as Farland gets a few words from Bob Griffin. And again, Griffin mentioning to me that maybe finally, after five games of the season, Farland has been able to shake that terribly big Earhart shadow which has hung over him and URI. How do you follow an All-American like that? And he's kind of carving out his own niche now and maybe getting some confidence. And I mentioned to Griff yesterday, I said, hey, when you're 0-5, what's there to be nervous about? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, Greg Farland, as we mentioned earlier in the pregame, does not have the supporting cast that a, that a Tom Earhart has. And we, we know, Ken, that he has a, a fine arm, a strong arm. The, the big thing here is he's moving his ball club. They aren't on the board yet, but he's getting movement. They're driving the football. Now they can avoid that breakdown. Hopefully they'll be able to score. Pratt and Potasic are the two split ends. Schwab and Mitchell are the tight ends. Haynes the lone setback on first down from the 11. Farland to throw. Lops the ball for Pratt. It is intercepted again. Mark Seals. Trying to loft the ball for Pratt, and Seals played it nicely positioning himself in between and picked it off. Again, the interception in the end zone. This time it's sealed. And that time, this may have been uh, this may have been a mistake by Farland. I believe he wanted to throw over the outside shoulder of Pratt. Then he throws it to the inside. Sealed has a position there. You see the ball come down. See, he's got the inside position. You need to lay that ball up into the far corner to give Pratt a chance to get under it. BU takes over, first and 10 from their own 20-yard line. 440 left in the first half, and another URI attempt picked off in the end zone, second of the afternoon. Mancini pitches back to Vince Jackson, turns the corner, 25-30, dances and moves his way to the 31-yard line. Well, this is interesting. Mancini bobbles the snap coming up, an option play. You don't see BU option the ball too much. Now watch him bobble the ball. Whoops. He gets a handle on it, starts down the line, he pitches to Jackson. Now watch Jackson make Landry miss with that move. Gets to the outside. That's super speed and acceleration. And picks up another first down. Of course, that's a defensive lineman or a linebacker in your case. That's a nightmare when a guy bobbles the ball because that gives him just an extra second or so if he maintains his composure to figure out what he's going to do with it and throw you off. Jim Bunnell goes a yard on this play and not much more. Again, the freshman Gilman 
playing over the center at nose guard. A couple of scores to check out, Steve. UMass is leading Maine 10 to nothing in the third. And Northeastern 20 to 13 over UConn in the third. William and Mary 14, Delaware 10 in the fourth. Of course, we saw Delaware tear up UMass last week right here on Nesson. Mancini, pass incomplete, and a penalty marker comes out. Pass was intended for Jackson. Maybe a holding call here. Well, I believe that uh, the illegal use of the hand, yeah, that's what it is. Bill Brown was blitzing from the right side, and it appeared that uh, Mark Moylan was beaten, just reached out and shoved him from behind. And it's declined. Okay, here it is. Now watch from the left side of your screen. Right there, see Brent? Well, he's chopped. Maybe the penalty was inside. Gilman was also putting the pressure on. Either Brown or Gilman drawing the infraction. Thought it was interesting a couple of weeks ago, you and I were in a conversation. You said uh, once in a while uh, an offensive lineman would grab a hold of your jersey, but underneath so the official could not see it. And they, they get good at that. Yeah, <laughs> seldom called, right? Well, when you keep it in close, it's, it's very hard for the officials to detect it. But we saw the umpire throw his hands out, so that one had to be pretty obvious. As Mancini wants to throw on third down, and he has Gadboy at the 44. What a game Gadboy is having. Finding the open spot, and it's good for another BU first down. When he comes back, I was talking with Coach Stetson during the week about this young man. He thinks a great deal of Gadboy. There you see Mancini forced out of the pocket, rolls to his right. Now watch right on the sidelines, he spots Gadboy. Gadboy knows where he is. That was, that was a great uh, sense of, of where you are by Gadboy. He realized he's close to the sideline, stop, got those feet down. 3.46 remaining in the first half. Hand off to Jackson and back to the line of scrimmage and nothing more. Gadboy came in with 1,724 yards and nine touchdowns and 119 receptions and a second all-time on the BU list for receptions and yards and so far today he has two catches for 25 yards I beg your pardon he has four catches for 32 yards Dennis Gadboy who now splits wide to the far side Ferrara is in the slot as Mancini takes his time with the count. Here's Bunnell, and he is hit right at the line of scrimmage and maybe gets a yard on the play. Damien Hewlett, the big senior, really put a stick on it. So this time he got by the nose guard Gilman, but Hewlett steps up and puts a nice hit on it. Time to bundle up, homecoming crowd. Sun has been under the clouds now most of the afternoon. Fortunately, though, the breeze has died down some. It was really whipping around here this morning. Makes it a tough ball to throw. Mancini on third and eight likely will throw on this one. Bunnell, the lone setback. Over the middle, pass to Andy Wise. It's big tight end and another first down at the 44-yard line. Wise comes up with some high fives. Well, he's working against the safety carbone. Turns it up inside. Mancini with a real nice pass to him. Mancini with a lot of time sets up. There you can see it. Wise with that inside move away from Carbone. Timeout is called, and now the defense goes over to huddle around Tim Karras and the other coaches on the far sideline. Here you see Andy Wise, a redshirt sophomore, 6'4", 227, recruited as a quarterback. Suffered a punctured lung against UMass, and... That game last year. Those ex-quarterbacks make uh, good athletes, Ken. You know, Absolutely. Uh, I was an ex-quarterback, you know. That's right. And you played a little <laughs> All bit. All the way in back the... to high school. Even uh, my freshman year of college, I started out as a quarterback. And you played, uh, when you went to Tulsa, they had you playing some in the defensive secondary. Right. Uh, and then fact, you moved to uh, linebacker. Interesting, finally. I was uh, one of the larger free safeties. <laughs> in the and eventually, I went from free safety to uh, defensive end. That's a heck of a combination. 
and then uh, finally wound up as a linebacker with the Patriots and uh, against uh, playing for a guy that uh, was interested in you when you were playing in high school right Chuck, Chuck Fairbanks. Fairbanks of course I wanted to go to the Op uh, University of Oklahoma did not get a scholarship offer there ended up going to the University of Tulsa and uh, ironically did end up with Chuck Fairbanks eventually as he came over to the Patriots that's your career in a capsule <laughs> right well, Two part of it. Uh, <laughs> 2.16 remaining in the first half. BU 7-0 and on the move here from the 45. Mancini hands off to Jackson. Look at, look at that explosion. 35. Down to the 32-yard line. He'll just ride people out there. Once he gets those legs moving, he's a tough target to bring down. Another first down. Well, Pettis not coming back into the ball game. They get his right hand and wrist taped heavily. But the freshman Jackson doing a tremendous job. And two minutes remaining in the first half. Each team with one timeout remaining. Slot to the right side. Fennell and Jackson dotting the eye. Mancini to throw. Will keep. Pump fakes a couple of times. 27-yard line steps out. Mancini at 6'3", 220 pounds. He's a good-sized quarterback. He has good movement, too. Uh, once, he, once he pulls that ball down and starts to scramble out of the pocket, uh, good feet, gets out of there quickly, and a big physical type of guy, too, running the ball. Second down and five. With a minute 42, clock is stopped on the out-of-bounds play. Winston, wide to the near side. Gadboy, wide left. Second down and five for the Terriers. And off Jackson, explodes through the middle, 20-yard line, still on his feet, cuts back, 15, 10, 5, and to the 2-yard line. What a run by Vince Jackson to the 2-yard line as he was hit several times along the way and delivered the mail to the 3. All right, a quick hitter here. It catches you are by surprise. Great blocking up front. Now, what you make Granitelle miss right there in Carbone? No, here's Granitelle. Excuse me, Carbone early now. The inside move on Granitelle. That's a, that's a great move. That's an unbelievable move. Ray Williams finally pulls him down on the three where it's first and goal, and there's Vince Jackson now dotting, or he's actually a wing back to the left side. Bunnell is the fullback, slot to the right. Hand off Bunnell, straight up for a yard. Well, I'd like to see that play again. Uh, once he got through the line of scrimmage and he was untouched as he broke downfield, here it is, to the right side. Nice action by the offer. Excuse me, that's the uh, that's last Bunnell's play. Bunnell is, uh, from his fullback spot, Steve, has had like three or four carries here, all for a yard. Hasn't been much on the inside. Now Ferrara goes in motion. Here's the pitch to Jackson. Tries to turn it, leaps in, and scores! But a penalty marker comes out, and there may be a holding call on the play. Jackson leaped into the air and went into the end zone, but a holding call against the Terriers will call it back. Well, this is a shame. Running wide to the short side, he gets some great blocking from his offensive teammates and dies over a pile of would-be tacklers into the end zone, but uh, going to be nullified by that penalty. Jackson... Five carries, 91 yards. So it'll be second and goal from the eight-yard line after the five-yard walk-off. 36 seconds remaining in the first half. BU 7 to nothing. Garoni! Mancini rolls to the left side. Lofts the ball for Gadboy over his head and incomplete. Got a hand on it. Well, there he's battling again with Ray Williams. Ray Williams wins this one again. Mancini, little roll out to the left. He wants Gadboy all the way. Now, the ball underthrown, a good adjustment by Gadboy, but Williams again, right with him, tips the ball away. Ray Williams, the Hendrick and High School product from a big family. Matter of fact, his brother Jerry, a running back for this ball club, and his brother Steve plays for Boston College. 
Football runs in the family. Third down and eight yards to go. 32 seconds left. Gadboy went in motion as Mancini wants to throw, and the pass is tipped and incomplete. Well, whoever tipped that ball can prevent it. Six points, Gadboy wide open. This time, Gadboy took an inside move. Williams started to go with him. Then someone picked, actually came in and picked Williams. Now watch it here. All right, we won't be able to see the move to the outside by Gadboy, but right there, the ball was tipped. We, okay, I didn't get that number. It looked like the defensive end on the right side. And a field goal attempt coming up by Dan Green, a 25-yarder. The boot is on its way, and this one's good. So he splits the uprights with the 25-yard field goal, and with 23 seconds left, it's now a 10 to nothing ball game. That may have been Mulcahy who deflected the ball. The Rams fortunate that they come out of that jam just giving up a field goal. That could have very well been a touchdown as Gadboy was wide open and Absolutely. Mancini had spotted him. Right, wide open. Nesson's coverage of Boston College football continues this Tuesday night as the Eagles play host to the Louisville Cardinals. Tape delayed coverage Tuesday evening at 7.30. Make sure and check your Nesson listings for other broadcast times. So Eric Reed and former BC and pro star Peter Cronin will describe all the action, including game analysis with coach Jack McNell. That's the Louisville Cardinals and the BC Eagles Tuesday, 7.30, right here on Nesson, where we deliver. The field goal comes with 23 seconds left in the first half, and BU now has a 10-0 lead. And the squid kick, falling on at the 35-yard line, and the Rams will have 21 seconds to try to put it in the end zone here, should they choose. Aaron Smith was the man who fell on the football at that point. Let's take another look and see if we can pick up Mulcahy's tip. All right, here it is, right here. Gets the big left hand up. Right hand, excuse me, that is Mulcahy. And that was a touchdown saving play by Mulcahy. Farland to throw with 21 seconds left in the half. Screen pass, right side. And Haynes falls down as he tries to make a turn at the 36 yard line. And the Rams take their last time out with nine seconds left. Time for a Hail Mary here. <laughs> you know, real quickly, uh, before this next play, Ken, the Boston University offensive line being shuffled around, and we had talked about this earlier. Of course, uh, Mokaiber, who had been starting for the tackle with mononucleosis, he's out of the lineup, probably out for the year. Steve Setson's shuffling that offensive line around, and I'll tell you what, They've done a nice job of adjusting to their new positions. They're executing their blocking very, very well. Interesting, Steve, that last year after no shoulder sprains, now the Rams are facing four shoulder sprains. And Ed Kajawa, who is uh, the starting left tackle, has a shoulder problem that he suffered back in the Towson game. He had a setback on Monday, so a lot of people struggling with injuries here right. out there playing hurt. And he's probably their best offensive lineman, kid. Nine seconds remaining. Farland wants to throw. Quick drop. He's open. And now has to eat the football. And the clock will run out as the half ends. And Arnie Galvez ends the first half on a BU note as the Terriers take a 10 to nothing lead into the locker room at halftime. A strange, strange ball game so far with a couple of intercepted passes thwarting URI drives. BU had driven down. They ended drives on fourth down or fumble situations. Mancini finally hit Vince Jackson. Jackson doing the major work of the 36-yard touchdown play. Seven to nothing was the score with 6.49 remaining in the first half. Then, with 23 seconds left, Dan Green had the 25-yard field goal, a 10 to nothing ball game. We're going to be talking with Bob Griffin, the URI coach, in just a moment. But Steve, a lot of mistakes, I guess you would expect from these two ball clubs. A pretty tight first half, and really, I think anybody's ball game, although BU carries the momentum into the locker room. Well, they do, and uh, 
URI has to come back out, uh, establish something. They've moved the ball well, Ken. They've just had the breakdown. And, of course, the two big interceptions uh, by the Terriers in the end zone as URI was driving and balls actually that were just underthrown by Greg Farmer. And, of course, Steve Stetson has seen some encouraging things here in the first half. Bob Griffin has seen his team move the ball up and down the field, but again being stopped by those two interceptions. And now let's check in with Coach Bob Griffin, who is down on the sidelines. Bob, thanks for joining us. The two intercepted passes in the end zone, killing drives. Well, certainly they are. I mean, you get the ball down the field, and you've got to try something out of it. And we just, uh, you know, we've been unable to do that. I think uh, the first one uh, was very, very close. I think there was a struggle for the ball. And, of course, the BU defender came up with it. The second one, it was just, uh, you know, underthrown. And, and, of course, number five made a great play. And uh, there you go, all that uh, yardage and such for nothing. Uh, so, obviously, in the football game, we've got to stop doing things like that. Bob, as you've gotten deep into the Terriers' uh, uh, part of the field, uh, I've noticed they've started coming with the inside blitz from the inside linebackers. Now, anything that you'll try to uh, counter that with in the second half? Well, we will. We've talked about it. Of course, we saw it from the sideline, and, and we really have not done a good job of picking it up. It's been a, uh, it has been a disturbing factor, and it's probably uh, contributed not to the interceptions, but some of our ineffectiveness down there. And uh, obviously, it's something we have to handle in the second half. Bob, thank you for your time. Appreciate okay. it. Good luck in the second half. Thank you. Bob Griffin, head coach at URI. And we'll return with our halftime information. We have a special interview with Tony Hill, a former URI All-American, and now a member of the Red Sox organization. All that coming up with the score at halftime. Boston University 10, Rhode Island nothing. It's fun watching games on TV, but I'm the demanding type. Hi, I'm Paul Harning, and football's been a big part of my life. To keep up with it, I go straight to the source, the sporting news. For my money, nothing else even comes close. Each issue covers more yardies than you get from broadcasts, newspapers, and all other sports weeklies and monthlies combined. Who's headed for the playoffs? Their conference title? The Super Bowl. Who's making the tackles? Catching the clutch passes? Causing the turnovers? Getting that vital third down yardage? Who's ranked where in college football? And which pro teams may surprise? I love it. Not just the action, but the way the sporting news gives me an insider's look at what's really going on in football. The key matchups, the scouting reports, the stats behind the standings. From the training camps and rookie sensations to the Super Bowl and the old dependable pros. The previews, picks, and football's hottest issues. Stick with the sporting news and you won't miss a single sack, takeaway, breakaway, or touchdown. And you'll get the same straight story on baseball, basketball, hockey, and boxing too. That's the way I like my sports coverage, and this is where I get it, in the sporting news. So can you. Call now and get 36 issues of the sporting news for one half the regular subscription price. In addition to the regular weekly issues, you'll get special preview issues at no extra cost. So call now, toll-free, 1-800-553-4040. And you can even pay in three easy installments of only $5.99. This is the lowest price available anywhere for the sporting news. So call now, 1-800-553-4040. That's 1-800-553-4040. That's the way I like my sports coverage, and this is where I get it, in the sporting news. So can you. Ken Bell and Steve King from Meade Stadium, homecoming for the URI Rams, and pretty much a dismal first half and from the scoreboard standpoint, BU 10 and Rhode Island nothing. Yesterday, an outstanding soccer game between these same two schools, BU coming into the game, ranked number one in New England, and the URI Rams with upsets on their mind. Now let's join Sean McDonough for a recap of yesterday's exciting action. Thank you very much, Ken, and good afternoon, everyone. Sean McDonough, along with Scott Gray. We hope you're enjoying Yankee Conference football this afternoon here on Nesson. Coming up right after the football game, we have one of the most exciting college soccer matches that we've seen this season here on Nesson. The URI Rams playing host to the BU Soccer Terriers, and the BU Soccer Terriers saw their unbeaten season come to an end. They came in at 10-0-2, ranked sixth in the nation, number one in New England, but they lost to the URI Rams by a score of 2-1 to 
just a great, well-played match by URI and really a sluggish performance early on, I thought, by BU. And it was certainly the sluggishness that cost them the game, the early sluggishness. If somebody had uh, blown Reveille just a little bit earlier for BU, they had their chances and really turned it into quite a game. But instead, it turns things into a very tight situation in New England college soccer. Yes, it does. The Boston University Terriers, with that loss, we are expecting will probably remain number one in New England, at least for the time being. But they have some tough matches on the horizon particularly one ahead with the Harvard Crimson. It wasn't supposed to be ahead. It was supposed to have been played earlier this past week. But the lights went out at Nickerson Field. They weren't able to play it. That might have had an effect on the match for the Terriers against the Rhode Island Rams. They talked all week about the Harvard match. They weren't able to play it. They were disappointed because there had been so much anticipation, and they were playing very well before the lights went out, and as a matter of fact, had a one nothing lead over Harvard. They came out flat. That might have had something to do with it. Well, I'm sure it could have because they had been looking so forward to that. And just having that match postponed until late in the season put so much pressure on them because it became that much more important. And as a result of today's match, the Harvard match becomes even much more important again. That's New England College Soccer coming up right after Yankee Conference football, the Rhode Island Rams against the BU Terriers. We hope you're enjoying the football game. Let's send you back now to Ken Bell. What is the next game, is it? Ken Bell, back at Mead Stadium. Thank you very much, Sean. And, of course, Nesson soccer coverage all season long. You can see the finest in New England college soccer right here on your New England sports network. UConn will be the next ball game on Monday against Notre Dame. Right now, we're at halftime. We'll take a pause and be back with a special guest. With the score, Boston University 10 and Rhode Island nothing. If you don't read the Wall Street Journal, you're saving a little time. When you could be investing it. Call 800-336-1111 for this special introductory offer. 13 weeks for just $29.50 with a money-back guarantee. 13 weeks, $29.50. Phone 800-336-1111 now for the Wall Street Journal. Rich in tradition. I declare the 100th commencement ceremonies of the University of Rhode Island officially open. Always the pursuit of of excellence. Facilities that we're dedicating today mean that our students will go into the marketplace with the latest high technology skills. The University of Rhode Island. Great for a lot of reasons. For my students, my grad students, they ought to be pushing me as hard as they can. And they do. That's fun. I like that. URI is great for a lot of reasons. Zoology professor Dr. Stan Cobb is one of them. Teaching, doing research, it's a wonderful combination. No, I wouldn't try it for anything. I really wouldn't. You're in a lecture room or you're in a small classroom, you're in a, you're in a laboratory, talking to people, showing them what you know how to do best. Why do I teach? I teach because I enjoy it. Setting the pace in higher education. The University of Rhode Island. Ken Bell along with Steve King were at halftime from the University of Rhode Island. And the first half owned by Boston University, 10 to nothing. It's homecoming here, so the band is out entertaining the troops and a pretty decent crowd here. A lot of people coming back from all around New England to witness this homecoming game. Boston University coming in with just one win and the Rams winless so far. Both teams desperately needing a victory. And so far, BU has shown some real signs of coming to life. Of course, the Rams having two intercepted passes, which really caused some problems in the end zone, killing drives and forcing URI back on defense. And when you look at the way the first half played, Greg Farland has thrown the ball fairly well, although not completing a lot of passes, but has hit some targets that have gotten some big chunks of yardage, but unable to deliver any kind of points on the scoreboard, which actually is what the Rams desperately need to do at this point of the season. The first touchdown came with 6.49 remaining in the first half of play with the Rams giving up some big yardage. It was Vince Jackson 
the outstanding tailback who came in after Randy Pettis has, had injured his arm, and Jackson races 36 yards with the touchdown pass. It was really just a flare-out, and Jackson did most of it himself. Well, he really did. It was a well-executed play. The screen play, I mean, see, rolling to his left and back to his right, giving his lineman time to set up in front of Jackson. Jackson getting some great downfield blocking and, of course, great running ability, doing a fine job of filling in for Randy Pettis. The pass... Picked off in the end zone by Seals, ending one of the URI threats. Uh, really great defensive plays. One, the ball was stolen away. Right. Uh, Jim Muse on one play, uh, or excuse me, I, I believe it was Steve Schwab, number 81, running down the end zone. Here we see him, the coverage. Now it looks like he's going to be able to extend out and catch the ball. But Jackson comes back, gives the inside man help, and makes the interception. That was a big turnover for the Terriers. Speaking of turnovers, that's been one of the real problems the Rams have had all season, and no exception today. It turned the ball over on the fumble and led to the BU touchdown. Well, as we said, uh, minus 11 in the turnover ratio coming into this ballgame. Now they're at about minus 14, two interceptions and a fumble. Now, Greg Farland moving his team very well, but experiencing problems as they start their drives. Here, the pass, the short pass to Haynes makes McLaughlin miss gets downfield. Now right here, Seals is going to strip him of the ball. There it goes, and Cook comes in, makes a recovery for the Terriers. The Terriers doing a nice job of closing on Haynes once he gets downfield, and they're swarming today. Then, just a couple of plays later, the flare out to Jackson, and bang, he's into the end zone. The explosiveness of this man is something else. Well, it really is, you know. He comes in, he's a freshman. Randy Pettis goes out, he comes in, he does a fine job. Mancini's going to take the snap here. Here you see it. Now watch him. He rolls to his left. The linebackers are influenced. Back to his right. The offensive lineman there sliding out in front of Jackson. Jackson's going to pick a nice block up from number 70, Tim, on Williams. Williams gets sealed to the outside. He comes back, tries to make a tackle, but Jackson, with great, uh, great balance, shakes that tackle, turns on the speed down the sideline for the Terriers' first score. Rams have an opportunity. Again, moving the ball down. Again, something goes wrong in the end zone. Ball is underthrown. Well, this time, uh, he was looking for Jim Pratt in the end zone. Greg Farland with the drop back. He's seeing a lot of blitzing here. See number 28 coming there. He's picked up well on the blitz, but the ball underthrown allowed Seals with the underneath coverage to pick it off. Now, he needed to get that ball into the far corner to give Pratt a chance to come down with it. Instead, he throws the ball to the inside, and Seals had the coverage there. So, uh, again, the breakdown killing the Rams. Dan Green then tagged on the 25-yard field goal and it's 10-0 here at the end of the first half. Now, if you're in the locker room with the Rams, what are you telling guys? I mean, it's got to be got to be frustrating now. You've been down there twice and had two passes picked off. Well, I believe Bob Griffin has to tell his team, we've moved the ball well. We've just, we've just beaten ourselves on those drives. We're moving the ball, but we're turning it over. We're having breakdowns, and we've got we've to stay after it. Uh, we can move the ball. We know we can move it against them. So let's get down there, guys, and not make mistakes and not turn the ball over. Here in the other locker room and talking with Steve Stetson and BU, you've seen a lot of good things here in the first half and some signs of life. Well, he has some very positive things to build on at halftime. Uh, they've made their mistakes as well, but not as many as the Rams. And, of course, I think the big reason they're doing so well is that offensive line who has been, who's, who's been shuffled around this weekend is executing so well. They're doing some tremendous blocking for Vince Jackson, allowing him to break past that line of scrimmage and, and really use his speed downfield. Okay, and we'll return with more halftime for Meade Stadium homecoming here at Kingston with a score. BU 10 and URI nothing. Nesson has it all this fall in championship auto racing. The major events in the fall lineup from the Thompson International Raceway big events like the Winston 300 and the World Series of Championship Auto Racing. The Stafford Motor Speedway will be on hand with excitement from events like the Pentex 200 and the Coca-Cola Fall Final. This fall, Nesson has it all in championship auto racing. With the best in fall events, Nesson is your sports connection for auto racing. I'm Charles Schwab. Over one million investors who make their own investment decisions trade with us. Here are a few reasons why. 
Bill, I got some advice for you. It uh, won't help your golf game, but it'll do wonders for your wallet. I'm listening, Jay. I've been buying and selling stock through Charles Schwab. Schwab? He's a discount broker. Right. I've been saving 50, 60, sometimes over 70% on commissions. Well, I've heard of Schwab, but frankly, I've wondered what kind of service I might get from a discount broker. Schwab will surprise you. I've never had better service or faster trade executions anywhere. And, of course, there's no sales pressure. Well, good. I hate sales calls, and I like to save money. Schwab sounds like my kind of broker. For a free booklet on how you can save up to 76% on brokerage commissions, call 800-762-3100, toll-free. That's 800-762-3100. Charles Schwab, a Bank America company, member SIPC. Just looking at the new issue of the fan, and I'll tell you what, it's a real winner. Inside, you'll find Red Sox playoff previews, pitch-by-pitch -pitch Roger Clemens stats, and a new look at what really happened in 75. You'll also catch up on the Patriots' start, the Bruins' chances, and much more. Read the fan. It's the Sports Monthly for New England. Ken Bell, Steve King, halftime winding down here at Kingston. BU is leading 10 to nothing. And Steve, take a look at the halftime statistics here. And look at the rushing difference. BU, mainly behind Vince Jackson. 166 yards to 35 for URI. Well, they've really taken advantage of uh, that offensive line's ability to open big holes. And Vince Jackson ripping off some huge chunks of yardage. Randy Pettis successful early on before he went out with that injury to either his wrist or elbow. And then 284 yards total offense. The Rams have 147 through the air. And in the first half, Farland completed 14 passes out of 27 thrown, and he had 147 yards. And each team with three turnovers, but the turnovers have really killed the Rams. And the big interceptions, of course, in the end zone as the Rams were driving downfield. The Terrier defense uh, coming up with the big play when it has to. And uh, they're doing a fine job of defensing Doug Haynes also. Haynes with not as much room running out of the backfield on those pass patterns. They're jumping on him early, Ken, trying to take uh, Doug Haynes' uh, pass-catching ability away from this Ram team. So I'm looking for Farland to go more to Schwab and people like Jim Pratt. There you see the Terriers ready to come out on the field for the second half here. And when you've had just one victory on the season and you take a 10-0 lead into the locker room at halftime, you've got to feel pretty good about it. And across the way, some people who got to see the game without forking over the couple bucks to come in the ballpark. <laughs> On the third tier of the dormitory. That's right. And there you see the Terriers running back out onto the field. Again, kind of a crisp afternoon. The sun warmed things earlier. The wind died down from what it was this morning, but it's chilly here. The fans bundling up, getting ready for a wide open and wild second half, I'm sure. 10-0, Boston University leads, and let's go down to the field and talk with Steve Stetson, Boston University football coach. Steve, the, the big player in the, in the first half had to be Vince Jackson. How is Randy Pettis? Uh, cut his hand up pretty badly. We, he can play. We're not, sure, we're not sure if he can hold the ball with that hand, but he can, he can play. How much he plays, I'm not sure. Well, Jackson really came in. You didn't lose a thing back there. No, Vinny... Vinny has been running real hard in practice, and he's going to be a great player. He's looking real good right now. Coach, your uh, secondary coming up with some big turnovers, especially when the Rams were driving the ball on you. Uh, playing very well back there. I noticed also the inside linebackers blitzing, putting Farland back on his heel. Will you continue with that sort of game plan if you are penetrate your territory? Yes. We're, uh, as far as we're concerned, the game starts over right now in about a minute. We're just going to go after him again this half, same way we did first half. Steve, Good luck, Steve. Thank, thank you, you very much. Good luck in the second half. Steve Stetson, BU football coach. I think he's feeling pretty good right now. You can kind of sense a 10 nothing lead, although he's all business here for the second half. Anything can happen. But it's nice when you can go in and talk about positive things at halftime as opposed to talking about being down 10 to nothing. Well, he has something to build on. And, of course, his defense will take the, the field first here. So 
he's getting them fired up. They've been turning the ball over, getting the job done when they had to. So uh, things going uh, Boston University's way, and uh, this this will be a critical opening drive for the Rams, in my opinion. If they can move the ball, get a score on this first drive, it's going to do a lot for them in this ball game and enable them to have a shot to come back. BU losing its opener to Delaware State, then to Wake Forest 31-0, then losing to New Hampshire, beating Maine, and then losing to Richmond. And Steve Stetson just hoping that his team can turn things around here today and set them up well for the last part of the season. Of course, Bob Griffin, having played through five games of futility, looking for the same thing for his Rams, hoping that this could be the key to the second half of the season. We'll know in another 30 minutes of football, BU is leading 10-0 as we get the opening kickoff from Dan Green and it carries to Doug Haynes at the 10 yard line to the 20 to the 30 the 40 to the 50 yard line and he's bumped out of bounds to the 46 and he found the trough and used it to the 46 the penalty marker is down Mark Seals will get a, a penalty here a little bit extra as he drives Doug Haynes out of bounds by that Rams bench he tries to slam him he gets the yellow flag. Here it is. Great blocking by this return team. Look at the hole that Doug Haynes has right there. Makes a tackle or miss. Keeps his balance. Now Seals makes contact. Now watch right here. Seals lifts him up, tries to slam him to the ground. A little bit too much there. 46-yard return by Haynes from the 46. Farland to throw. Haynes has it, and he's bumped down immediately at the 42-yard line. And you can see the BU defense is fired up. Well, I've got to back up here, Ken. There was not a penalty called. I thought I saw a yellow flag go down when Seals drove Haynes out. Here's All right, the here's, catch. The, here's the catch on the opening play in the flat. And Haynes really takes a lick from Kevin Piggott as he picks up only three yards. Piggott moving to a linebacker spot after playing in the defensive secondary. Harlan with a deep drop. Gets the chase, and now over the middle pass is caught by Schwab. I, I beg your pardon, that's Jim Muse, and he's down to the 34-yard line. Well, Reibold had good position. It appeared he might intercept Hello. this football. The ball was thrown hard, but watch. Jim Muse is going to come back towards the football. Here's Farland. He's looking. He sees Muse. Now Muse comes back to the ball right there. See? Reibold coming across, but Muse just coming towards the ball, coming in front of him, making a nice reception. First and 10, 35. Harlan, quick drop, the pass to Pratt on the right side. He's bumped out of bounds at the 27. Trying to get the hands into the fastest man of the team, trying to get the ball over there, but Pratt is well covered. It's maybe a five-yard pickup, second and five. They like that play to Pratt. They know that those cornerbacks have to respect that great speed of his. And he has a little room to make that stop move. And if Farland keeps throwing the ball that way, that play will continue to be successful. Farland now 167 yards, 17 out of 30. And he'll throw again, rolling right. Pass is caught once again on the sideline, and Pratt is out of bounds. Has the first down at the 20-yard line. And that's what we've talked about. Pratt with that sense of where he is on the football field. He actually caught that ball leaning over the sidelines, but stretching out, keeping one foot down in the uh, field of play. There's Pratt now splitting wide to the far side. Farland thrown 31 times. We may see 60 before the game is over with. Of course, that's a more typical number of Earhart last year. Farland screen pass, Haynes. He's being chased and will be wrapped up and brought down at the 29-yard line by Ricky Cook. All right, Piggott, number 45, is putting the heat on here. Now you can see the screen developing, the lineman starting to slide, Piggott getting his hands up, making fun and throw it high. McLaughlin, the linebacker, had read the screen, forces Haynes back to the inside, and the pursuit catches him. Second down, 19. Farland to throw again. Lost the bomb. It is almost picked off incomplete. Well, he overthrew Muse, and Pratt was another 10, 10 yards down the field and closer to the sideline. 
and Mark Seals was there again. Well, Seals was coming over to cover Jim Pratt. Farland wanted to get the ball to Muse. Seals read it, came back, and got close to uh, his second interception of the ball game. Third down, 19. Potasic splits wide to the near side. Pratt split wide right. As Farland wants to throw again. Over the middle, pass is up in the air and caught by Muse at the 19-yard line. Well, Schwab got a hand on it, batted it up, and Muse made the reception. Well, this was not a well-thrown ball. Farland behind Schwab. Here he throws the ball. Now, actually, that actually, was that defender. was the coverage man who tipped the ball to Muse, Raybold. number 49, Raybol, the inside linebacker. Muse uh, making a nice adjustment on the football. Fourth down and eight, and Mike Griffin comes into the ball game to try the field goal. It'll be a 34-yard attempt. Griff stands on his own 27. Bob Donfield to hold. High snap, Donfield has to eat it. He wants to throw the football. And lofts the ball to the right side. It is incomplete, intended for one of his men out there, incomplete. Pass was intended for Ken Kurtz, who was in on special teams. He's a defensive end. He saw a three, a 31, and went for it. <laughs> well, he was waving his arms. The bad snap there. Donfield rolling to his left, trying to make the adjustment. Now he sees Kurtz. Kurtz is waving his arms. He throws the ball. And you're going to see Clifford come into your screen there and break it up. A nice play by Ken Clifford. That could have been a touchdown. Snap was high, as you saw. And now BU takes over, having stopped another URI scoring drive. 10 to nothing, Terriers lead. Mancini wants to throw. Now will keep, cuts back inside, 25 and down at the 27. Jim Happy is there defending on the play, number 38. So Mancini directing the team. There you see he's inside his jersey, the flak jacket, which he wears to protect his ribs. He had rib problems last year. And of course the punctured lung. Steve Stetson on the sideline with his unit. Mancini sets them up second and two. 11.30 remaining in the third period. Fake pitch, Mancini rolls to the near side, wants to throw, has his tight end, Andy Wise. He makes the catch and then drops it. Wise was hit hard after he had made the reception and gave it up at the last second. Well, it was nice concentration by Wise to try to hang on the ball. There's the fake toss to Jackson, rolling out. Kurtz, the defensive end, is checking Mancini. Now, right there, he's bobbling the ball, but Granitelle comes in, makes enough contact to knock it away from Andy Wise. Third down and two. Rams defense looking to get its offense back on the field. Trailing 10 to nothing. And the handoff to Vince Jackson, and he is brought down, but not before he reaches the 32-yard line, and he has another BU first down. Just can't say enough about his explosiveness out of the backfield, Steve. He gets out of there so quickly finds the hole and bang well he really is finding the hole quickly Ken you're exactly right the offensive line doing a good job for him and he's reacting well to their blockers Bob Griffin and behind him number 14 Paul Galani the man who succeeded the outstanding Natick program and here's Mancini to throw again Farrar, 45, 40, 35, and bumped down at the 33-yard line. Chalk off another big gainer, and BU is now in URI territory at the 33. Well, here you're going to see it. Ferreira, this time from the slot position, again, the fake toss, the roll, roll out to the right. Mancini's going to see Ferreira in between the linebackers and the secondary. There you see Granitelle coming up from safety. Ferreira cutting back to the inside, a nice gain, 35-yard reception. 
by the 5'10 senior. And there's a from the backfield, and Jackson is brought down at the 37 in the backfield. Loss of a couple. Well, I think Jackson is wanting to run to the right side, and that play designed to go to the left, the collision with Mancini. Results in a big loss. Ten minutes remaining, third period. Ten nothing, BU leading. Now facing second down and 14. I formation, Tim Bunnell is the fullback. Vince Jackson dotting the eye. Slot left as Mancini wants to throw left. Gantboy makes the catch at the 33. No, they say it's incomplete. Took the official long enough to call the thing. Third down, 14. Overcast skies now at Mead Stadium. Temperatures cooling down. Receiver's hands will be cold the rest of the afternoon. Let's see if they try to get the ball to Jackson in this situation. On third and 14. Long count by Mancini. Two-step drop. Left side, Gatboy. Incomplete. Gadboy was there, but the hit put on immediately. Jim Happy, the linebacker. All right, he wants to hit Gadboy early. Hope he's got enough room after he makes the catch to get downfield. But Anthony Adam reacting while breaking it up, forcing the Terriers to punt. On fourth and 14. Steve Jones standing at his own 48-yard line. He was rough twice in this ball game, keeping drives alive. Let's see if the Rams go after this one. Jim Pratt, Chris Poirier are the two deep men. And the ball carries to the one and into the end zone. Touchback. You make a good point there, Ken. Uh, early in the ball game with those two roughing the punter calls, it really got BU out of the hole. URI uh, would have had great field position in both those cases. Instead, uh, the roughing calls, getting BU out of that situation where they'd be deep in their own territory. I guess that's one advantage of a cold day and your college sweetheart sit in the stands and bundle up. Does that bring back memories, Ken? No, because <laughs> I was always working during a game and you were always on the field, so. <laughs> Harlan wants to throw on first down. Down for Muse and overthrows him. Potasic was also back in that general vicinity, but he was definitely going for Muse, just simply overthrew him again. Second down and 10. Several weeks ago, Bob Griffin had mentioned that he was indeed sticking with Farland, although there had been some criticism that Farland had been ineffective and maybe he should turn to the freshman, Paul Galani, who had replaced Doug Flutie up at Natick. Farnham has been overthrowing a lot of his passes today. And this one for Pratt, he's got it at the 32 yard line. Well, that one was well thrown and there's a little exchange of words, but nothing more at back at the 10 yard line. So Pratt gives the Rams a first down at the 33-yard line. Again, that uh, respect for Pratt's speed, he's getting a lot of room out there to work off of, comes up with a big reception. His sixth reception, 49 yards. That one good for 12 and a first down. 9.22 remaining third quarter. Farland to throw. And Doug Haynes makes the, oh, he pops up the football and it will be called incomplete. Haynes made the catch. Kevin Pickett put a stick on him that coughed the ball up, and it's ruled an incomplete pass. Well, Haynes makes a nice adjustment. Rybol has him covered. Farland out of the pocket. He broke past Rybol, but Kevin Pickett Ooh. coming up and <laughs> separating <laughs> Doug Haynes from the football, and that could have been a fumble. You as a former linebacker, whenever you put a hit on like that, knock the ball loose, I imagine that's really what you live for. Makes you feel good, I'll tell you, when you uh, make the ball carrier drop that football. Second down and 10. 
McFarland drops again. Now the pass from Hughes. He one-hands it after the ball had been knocked up in the air, and the pass is caught at the 41-yard line. Ricky Cook was right there, but Muse did a nice job of concentrating and getting it. Well, he does do a great job of concentrating. I don't know how he pulls this ball down. Now, there's contact between he and Cook. Right there, Cook really is sort of on his back. Look at Muse. Stay after the football. One hand reaches out with his right hand as the ball's dropping, pulls it in. That's a beautiful catch. Third down and two. Winds up just two yards short of the first down. Haynes, the lone setback as Farland rolls to his right side. He has Jim Pratt, but he retreats to the 45 and will be pulled down at the 46, but he has the first down. Well, again, they give Pratt all that room out there. He's working off the wide side of the field, and when you back off a guy like Pratt, you're asking for, for trouble. Again, he just turns up. He starts upfield, turns up. Farland... A crisp pass right out there to him. And Mark Seals with the tackle. Seals with a necktie. 46-yard line. First and 10. Farland to the right side, and the pass is caught at the 49-yard line by Pratt once again. Chipping away five yards at a time. These scores to report. Massachusetts is leading Maine 16-7 to in the third. And Connecticut 26 to 20 in the fourth over Northeastern. So UConn has come back. And Delaware trailing William and Mary 17 to 10 in the third period. 807 remaining in the third quarter here. Farland looking for Muse. He has the football at the 36-yard line. Nice catch. Jim Hughes doing a great job from his tight end position now catching the football. Farland keeps rolling to the right away from that pressure. Muse goes down, picks that ball off right off the, the top of the grass. Paul Granitel was covering on the play. Muse with a nice catch and a first down at the 35. Potasic split wide to the far side. Muse split left. And nothing but drop and pass here. Long bomb. Incomplete intended for Potassic. Well, I imagine they want to mix in a running play one, one of these days. Uh, it's been pass, pass, pass as Farland now has thrown the ball 41 times. 25 for 41. Well, Potassic, there we see him running back to the huddle. They uh, just sent him on the go down the sideline. Farland airing the ball out, going for it all. Skip Jackson with nice coverage. Steve Stetson talking with Mancini and the rest of the offensive core there. The Rams have the football trying to drive, trailing 10 to nothing. Second down in 10. And again the pass. Farla looking over the middle. Pass caught nicely by Schwab and Steve slides to the 22-yard line. Farland is kept on the ground and gets up. He was pinned on the ground, didn't like it. Well, they had the blitz on again, Ken. They keep blitzing. This time, the offensive line. See number 28 sneaking up there. Here he comes. Now, watch Haynes steps up, picks off one man. The tackle comes across. Farland spots Schwab coming across the middle, rifles the ball in there. The nice reception by Schwab, and URI is on the move. Farland sets them up with seven minutes left in the third. Pass right side. Pratt has it out of bounds at the 15-yard line. The official almost took a nosedive. And it's another nine-yard pickup. Farland's looking very good in this drive. Now, he had thrown that ball as Pratt made his cut to the sideline. The ball was actually in the air before Pratt had turned. Farland, 238 yards now through the air. And he's really, as you said, Steve, come alive here in the third quarter. Much more accurate. And again, the short pass. Pratt has it. Down to the eight-yard line. Well, they're doing a nice job now. They're taking what the Terriers are giving them. Backing up on Pratt in that zone. The short rollout, the quick throw. Pratt hauls it in again. 
And now Boston University calls timeout as McLaughlin and Raybould come to the sideline to get some instruction. And it's first and goal from the eight. Well, McLaughlin coming over and uh, sort of holding his hands up to Stetson like, uh, gee, coach, I don't know. But uh, I think I know the Rams offensive line and Doug Haynes from his uh, running back position stepping up, picking up that blitz, doing a nice job, giving Greg Farland time to roll out and find his receivers. Of course, the Rams had two picked off in the end zone in the first half, so they've been down here before, just been their own worst enemy. Immediately following this live telecast of our Yankee Conference football game, we'll have the New England College soccer game between BU and URI from yesterday. That coverage will begin immediately following today's football game, and that was a dandy. BU coming into the game, the number one ranked team and undefeated in New England, and the URI Rams with upset on their minds. So next on Nesson, where we deliver right after our football game here. First and goal from the eight yard line. Potassic near, Pratt wide to the right. Haynes the setback. Farland drops, hit and knocked down by Keith McLaughlin. And he was just bumped down. Well, the Terriers execute the blitz this time. He gets the quick jump. He timed that perfectly. Comes around the right guard through the guard tackle gap. Really puts a shot on Farland. Up around the head too, Ken. Loss of seven yards. Second and goal from the 15. Farland wants to throw. Lofts the ball from Muse over his head and out of the end zone incomplete. Steve, do you wonder if maybe a draw play mixed in with all these passes might not have some effectiveness? Well, on that, that first down, I kind of expected them to... Uh, Look for Doug Haynes either on a draw or try to get him out of the backfield quickly on some sort of rollout action. Instead, they choose to go downfield looking for Mews or Pratt. And they're in a third and long situation here. Have they run the ball in the third quarter? I don't believe they have. I think it's all been passing. And here comes another one. Screen pass. Haynes. 20. And he is bumped down at the 17. Mark Seals finally puts him down. Well, that brings up the long situation, Steve, and this, as you said, uh, is a big missed opportunity if the Rams can't put it in the end zone. Well, they, they went to Clifford too late. This time, uh, the blitz wasn't coming, but watch, Steve McLaughlin's going for Haynes right away. He sees him trying to slip out of the backfield. Watch McLaughlin slide down the line. And Clifford as well, number 28. They're really doing a nice job of shadowing Doug Haynes today. Mike Griffin to attempt the 33-yard field goal. He missed one earlier in the ball game. This one is on the tee, and it's a straight shot, but off to the left, no good. And BU is held once again. Again, he actually uh, pulls the ball across his body and misses to the far left side. Actually, uh, that ball was short as well, not hit, uh, not hit well. The contact uh, on the ball was, was very poor. From the end zone, good snap this time. Donfield gets it down in good shape. Mike Griffin had his head down. Just hooks the ball, as you can see. A low kick as well. And again, the Rams come up empty. 5.29 remaining in the third quarter. And the officials need a football. <laughs> That's the holdup. Well, this is going to be frustrating for the Rams, moving the ball so well, penetrating uh, Terrier territory, and coming up empty. First and ten again, BU, hanging on to that ten-point lead. Ferrara goes in motion to the far side. Now Mancini wants to throw to the near side. Gatboy has it. And a seven-yard gain. It's funny because Ferrara was in motion. He had gone so quickly, and then when he got near the sideline, he had to take little baby steps <laughs> in order to <laughs> he did. continue to he do did. something. He realized where the play was going. There was no uh, 
no uh, sense in him trying to get an early break on the football and risk a motion penalty. So he just got out there and sort of took someone along, <laughs> waiting for the ball to be snapped. High formation now, Pinnell, flanked by Jackson. Vince gets the pitch out, and he will have very little running room. They have gotten back to the line of scrimmage, but nothing else. Clock continues to wind down with 4.40 remaining here. In the third period of play, BU sitting on a 10-0 lead. Mancini has had a fun afternoon so far. His team has moved the ball on the ground, through the air. Been stalled a couple of times down deep in URI territory. And some equipment problems here as Kurtz goes off the field. Well, Kurtz getting out there on that last play on the short side, keeping contained as Vince Jackson was trying to get the corner. And he was shaken up on that play. Skip Jackson on the sideline. He's had a good afternoon in that defensive secondary for BU. Now he's watching as Mancini faces a third and two. Hand off, Jackson up the middle, wrapped up. He may not have the first down. This will be very close, Ken. Mulcahy coming down hard, closes that hole extremely fast, wraps Jackson up, and I believe that he may be about half a length of the football short. And it's fourth down. Well, that, uh, the marker, of course, right on the 30-yard line, Ken. And they're just short of that 30, as you can see. Mancini wanted to go for it. It, it, looked, like, <laughs> it looked like Pat Mancini was looking over to Steve Stetson and saying, hey, let's go for it. But I think wisely he chooses to punt the football. Steve Jones, who got off a great kick the last time, stands on his own 16-yard line. Let's see what URI does here, Ken. This would be the time I think I'd want to go after one, get something happen, try to create uh, some sort of turnover. The official steps in and delay of game is called on BU. Maybe there was a little hesitation there and perhaps Stetson had in the back of his mind he might go for it, but then sent the punt team out and then setting up. They've drawn the five-yard walk-off. Well, they were slow getting on the field. Took too much time. You see uh, Jones setting up there. Jim Pratt is now wearing number 18 since his last jersey was ripped up. And he is one of the deep men back, along with Chris Boyer, and the ball comes to Pratt. And he'll take it at the 34, spins around, and will be brought down right at that point. So URI has the football, first and 10, with 2.58 remaining in the third period. So far, the only scores in the ball game, 6.49 left in the first half, Mancini to Vince Jackson, a 36-yard touchdown play, 7-0, then Dan Green's 25-yard field goal, and it's a 10-0 ball game. The Rams go on offense once again as Farland who has thrown for everything the Rams have gotten here in the third quarter. Drops back and wants to throw again. Has plenty of time. Now he has to scramble out, gets a block, and now Steve Schwab can't make the catch on the turf at the 37-yard line. Kevin Pickett was defending on Schwab. Ball was thrown low. How many passes is that now? 46. 28 for 46, 245 yards. And we have another quarter to go and two minutes and 50 seconds on top of that. We may see 60 passes, Ken. You may be right. Earhart had 65 in a game last year. Let's go, Steve! Farland to throw over the middle. Almost intended for the umpire. Doug Haynes can't get there. The umpire had to quickly put his head down or he would have caught it. 
third down and ten. That's the only problem, Steve, is if you don't complete one of those two passes on first or second down, you leave yourself with a third and long. And find yourself in the hole all the time. Right, right. And BU's been effective in these uh, situations when they get URA in the third and long. Pratt wide to the far side again, wearing number 18 after his normal number 24 was torn off. Lots of noise from the crowd trying to spark the Rams. And here the pass is complete to Pratt. And he has wrestled down. He has the first down, I think, at the 44-yard line. Well, he, he does. Nice second effort. Well, contact was made at about the 46, 47 yard line, which would have left him a yard or two short. Farley on the rollout, he hits Pratt. Now Pratt lowers his head. Seals trying to wrestle him down, trying to stop him. He spins there and throws him down forward to the 49 yard line, allowing Pratt to pick up that first down. 223 remaining third quarter. Farland to throw again. Over the middle, pass to Haynes. He has about three yards on the play. Well, they're having a tough time getting the ball to Doug Haynes today. That was a double team Mercer from defensive end coming off to help uh, Jack Reibold. They were actually double teaming Haynes in sort of an in and out type of defense. Second down and seven. 47 yard line. Far on the throw, blitz is on, pass incomplete. Get Schwab over the middle and the Terriers want grounding called. Pretty obvious that Farland just unloaded it. Well that time again, Reibold and McLaughlin, the inside linebackers coming hard on the blitz. Reibold to your right, McLaughlin on the left. McLaughlin comes clean this time. Farland does a nice job to avoid the sack. Has to throw the ball early. Schwab, just out of your picture there. The official ruling he was in the vicinity of the pass. BU mixing that blitz up very well today. 30 of 50, 259 yards so far for Farland. And he wants to throw again. Pratt has it. The defender seals it slipped down momentarily, and that allowed Pratt the room to catch it at the 44. You're exactly right, Ken, on that play. If Jim Pratt had realized that Seals had fell down and he had cut back to the inside, he had a chance to go all the way. Instead, when he caught the ball, he expected Seals to be there in the contact. He was protecting the ball, had his head down, going out of bounds. This is like the two-minute drill for the entire game. <laughs> Keep going to the uh, sideline. 135 left in the third quarter. Farland wants to throw. Looking for Pratt over his head at the 20 yard line. He was double covered back there and Farland had to throw long. Now the clock is stopped with 129 left in the third. Well, Pickett coming over and giving Skip Jackson help on that play. Pratt with no chance to come down with that pass. Farland now 52 attempts, 31 completions. Unless I'm wrong, my memory doesn't serve me properly. I, I think that uh, every play, offensive play, has been a pass here in the third quarter for the Rams. Farland's pass incomplete, but a penalty marker comes down from the back judge. And we may have an interference call. We'll skip Jackson a little uh, early on his uh, attempt to break that pass up. There's contact with, res with the receiver Pratt just before the ball arrives. And pass interference is the call. Now watch it here. Here's the ball being thrown by Farland. Now watch on the sidelines. Watch Jackson make the contact early. Right there, he bumped Pratt going for the football. We apologize for the technical difficulties. But we saw it the first time, right? <laughs> first and 10 here as Farland wants to throw again. Looking over the middle, he has Muse wide open at the 22. He's down to the 20. And the Rams have another first down. Well, we've got a flag down back by Farland as he was hit just as he released the ball. We may have a holding call against the Rams. Personal foul, roughing the passer. 
So that will be tagged on to the end of this one, Steve. Well, that's a break for the oh, Rams. I was following the ball. We have a penalty it. against URI also. A holding call, so they know so there was holding. Other. There right. was holding. And one of the Terriers is down at the 20-yard line. That's too bad. And Jim Muse uh, kind of favoring uh, his shoulder, it appears. As he comes back to the huddle. That was a nice job of Farland, by Farland, laying the ball over the linebackers who were in the short zone. And in front of the deep coverage, Muse coming across on the left side, over by the right hash, makes a nice reception. They close, make the tackle. Offsetting penalties. And again, uh, Ken, the Rams keep stopping themselves. John Holland, number 26, is the injured player who comes to the side. I beg your pardon. It's 28, Ken Clifford. You know your eyesight's going when six looks, looks like eight, and eight looks like six. <laughs> Minute 19 remaining in the third quarter here with a first and 10 now for Farland. There's the first running play that I can recall of the period. And it goes for a yard. Well, they were trying to catch him in the blitz. Rybo from his inside linebacker position stepping up, trying to get off on the snap of the ball on that blitz. Trying to block him quickly here. Right there, you see it. They were hoping to get the quick opener. But BU doing a nice job up front stuffing it. Second down and nine. Pratt comes to the near side and to the far side, Potassi. Haynes the setback as Farland brushes some grass out from under his cleats and now wants to throw. And lofts the bomb. He has Pratt who drops the football at the goal line. Wide open, had the ball, did a juggling act, couldn't get it. Well, Greg Farland very disappointed. Up until this point, Jim Pratt could do no wrong, making beautiful catches. He sees him running the post, wide open. He's beating seals now. He bobbles the football, can't hang on. Right there, you see it from the end zone. Doesn't look it all the way in. The ball bouncing away. Agony, agony for Jim Pratt. One of the things that has plagued the Rams through the season, dropped opportunities. Third down and nine. And the penalty marker comes out before the snap, and we have a delay call here. Actually, it may be uh, to their benefit that it was delay of the game. BU coming with the all-out blitz. Ken Clifford was coming up there from safety, and McLaughlin and Rybold, the inside linebackers, blitzing as well. So far in the ball game, Farland is 31 of 54, 268 yards. Mancini has 169 yards through the air, so quite a difference there. But the running game non-existent for the Rams, at least here in the second half. BU has been able to get an awful lot of mileage out of Vince Jackson, who came in for the injured Randy Pettis. Now they've got Pratt to the wide side here in the third and long. Let's see what develops. Mancini wants to throw, I mean uh, Farland. He lofts the ball for Schwab over his head and incomplete. Well, Kevin Piggott with the coverage. Piggott all over the field today, doing a nice job of covering the tight ends and giving help to those linebackers when Doug Haynes tries to sneak out of the backfield, having a big day. Bob Griffin has a word with Haynes on the sideline, makes some adjustments there, and now... Tom Centauri to punt the football at the 45. A high end over end kick. This one will land at the eight yard line. And again, the Rams put BU in the box back at the six yard line. So Centauri, who came in with a 29 yard average, has really done the job punting today, Steve. Well, he really has. Uh, that punt, uh, much like the uh, punt we saw early in the first quarter, kicking it very high, got a good bounce down around the five-yard line. This time they kill it uh, on about the five-and-a-half, six-yard line. And uh, 
that URI defense should be looking to turn the ball over early here. If they can get a quick score, they'll have an opportunity to get back in this thing. First and 10 from the six. Mancini hands off to Jackson, prances his way out to the nine yard line. Eight seconds remaining in the third period. That'll be the final play. And Boston University takes a 10 to nothing lead on its uh, way to the fourth quarter. And will return with a fourth and final period in just a moment. I'm Tom Watson. When I'm not playing golf, I like to read about it. And for my money, there's nothing better than Golf Digest. Golf Digest covers every angle of the game thoroughly. And now, you can get Golf Digest. Here's how. Call toll-free 800-453-8500 for a year of Golf Digest, only $12.77, 46% off the newsstand price, and you'll receive as a bonus tips from the tour free. Call 800-453-8500 now. Ken Bell, Steve King, take a look at the only touchdown of the ball game. Batman City rolling to his left, back to his right, the screen set up well. Jackson takes the ball, gets the good block from the offensive line, a downfield block from the receiver, turns on the Jets. The only touchdown, gets Jackson from the freshman. Back to live action, and Jack car uh, Jackson carries for a few yards out to a, about the 16-yard line, where it's third down. And it's a 10-0 ball game. That Jackson touchdown, along with Dan Green's 25-yard field goal, the story of the ball game. Actually, the story of the ball game, missed opportunities for the Rams. Two interceptions in the end zone, a drop pass there on the touchdown possibility by Pratt. Two missed field goals. They've just they've just beaten themselves here uh, up and up starting the fir the fourth quarter. Ken uh, mistakes and turnovers. Pat Mancini done a good job at quarterback today. Hands off to his fullback Bunnell, and again his one yard, and he has the first down. Bunnell has five carries. He had two, 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 and now one. <laughs> but the tough yardage up the middle is what they've needed. Well, third and one, a critical play, and Bunnell delivers for the Terriers. First down on the 17. And the handoff to Jackson again out of the backfield, and Happy is there to make the stop. A happy greeting at the 18-yard line. Gain of about a yard, maybe two. Let's call it second and eight. Some of the enthusiasm on the sideline here. Homecoming. Cheerleader was saying, come on, guys. Stop those mistakes. They're saying, I wish I'd worn my long johns. <laughs> As the afternoon wears on, the temperature dipping here. Mancini rolls to the right side, pitch out Jackson. Ooh, he's greeted by a swarm of blue jerseys and brought down behind the line back at the 17-yard line. Damian Hewlett was leading the way. Well, Damian Hewlett uh, shoots the gap here. I believe he was on the blitz. Putting pressure on Mancini right away. Mancini getting the ball to Jackson. Hewlett continued to pursue and force Jackson out of bounds. A couple of scores to pass on. Steve Umass is one. Bouncing back from the loss last week to Delaware, 23-13. Connecticut has beaten Northeastern coming from behind. Late in the fourth now, William and Mary over Delaware by 14 points. William and Mary must have a good team. That Delaware team very, very strong. Vince Jackson, 102 yards on 13 carries in the ball game. And Mancini is hit as he releases the ball. 
Ferrara was the intended receiver. Chris Santapietro is the man in making the play. And bringing up the fourth down situation. All right, Mancini looking to his left here, but Santapietro on him right away. Mancini just dumping the ball off, knowing he's going to be sacked. And Steve Jones is standing back at his two-yard line. Santa Petro was a fullback tight end two years ago. And the Rams have ten men up on the line of scrimmage in the rush. But Jones gets off the punt, and it's taken at the 49-yard line. Fair catch, Chris Boyer. So the Rams have it first and ten from their own 48. And good field position. It's just a matter, Steve, when they get down there, can they cash in? Avoid a mistake. Well, that's it. We see the, they're, they're moving the ball. They get it down, uh, penetrate the, ter the Terrier's uh, side of the field, down inside the 20-yard uh, line several times, and just right. turning the ball over and uh, missing uh, field goal opportunities. One drop pass by Pratt. It should have been a touchdown. Farlan to throw, lofts the ball for Pratt, it's incomplete. Look at this rushing total, BU 192, URI 22 yards on the ground. Wow. You take away a lot of your game when you just don't have the threat of rushing, and of course Haynes had 157 yards against UMass two weeks ago. Well, they were so effective from uh, that counter draw action, Haynes getting the ball, UMass was running five and six defensive backs, and with the one linebacker on the inside, Haynes was uh, on a he was in a one-on-one -on -one situation with that inside linebacker much of the afternoon two weeks ago. Today, BU using two inside linebackers, Rival and McLaughlin, for most of the game. Harlan the bond looking for Pratt, tipped away by Mark Seals again. Seals was right there, and those two have had a track meet today. Well, a classic battle today. Pratt catching a lot of balls. Seals taking him deep here. The ball just underthrown a little. Right there, allows Seals to get back, get that right hand on it, and knock it away. Seals has certainly been the man on the spot today. 6'1", 197 pound sophomore out of Syracuse, New York. Now there's a guy that can match Pratt speed for speed. Third down and 10. And again out of the hole, Farland to Potasic. He's put down at the 43 yard line. Steve Potasic, who had her brother Joe started at quarterback for the Rams, graduated back in 83. Now we've got fourth down, Ken, and it appears they're going to go for it. With 11.35 left. And the Rams shouting out encouragement from the sideline. Anthony Adams, number two, you saw. Fourth and four. Harlan rolls, pumps, lofts the ball, incomplete, and maybe, maybe if Muse has not touched it, Potasic would have had it. Well, he wanted to throw to Pratt. Pratt was covered on the sidelines. Piggott made good contact with Pratt. Right here, Farland, he's looking for Pratt. He has to pump there. Pratt's covered. Now, you see he's trying to roll away from Piggott, or excuse me, that's Skip Jackson. Now, Muse comes into the picture. If Muse had not tipped the ball, Pratt would probably have caught it. One of the Terriers is down. The two men over there, Skip Jackson and Reibold was also there. We'll see which one it is. Let's hope it's nothing serious. He is flat on his that face. Interesting thing about that play, if this had been... Uh, if this had been uh, a play in the pros, it would have been interference by Jackson. It's beyond that five-yard zone, but in college football, you can make contact with the receiver, which Jackson did wisely, forced Pratt to go wide there. And of course, uh, Muse coming into the picture, trying to uh, bring that ball down. This is Ken Clifford, who is on the ground the free safety suffered a separated shoulder against Delaware State and Steve he hasn't moved he is, has his face down and hasn't moved since he hit the deck 
So a big play, people flying around going for the football. And if we can take another look, perhaps we can see what happened to Clifford. There's a the ball coming down, Hughes tips it. Now, Clifford, coming into your screen here, he's going down, goes down his left shoulder, or elbow, it looks like. Here you see him rolling over. He again suffered that separated shoulder against Delaware State earlier in the season and maybe re-injured that. That was in the season opener. He's a tough kid. He had a knee injury last year, which put him out. No, he hasn't moved at all. He's still on his stomach. And they're bringing in a cart to take him off. One of those unfortunate things, and as you know, Steve, after playing with the Patriots, injuries are reality of this game. You had a broken wrist, you had a rib problems, you had a little bit of everything. The football is a tough game, and you expect to confront injury situations from time to time. Hopefully it's not a serious injury to Clifford. And BU can ill afford to lose Clifford, too. Uh, Depth being one of their problems this year. And you hate to see that come out on the field, the stretcher. BU nursing a 10 to nothing lead, trying to hang on here. The Rams had given up the ball. Clifford, 5'11", 187 pound junior from Boston, Long Island in New York. And he's still being attended to. Perhaps it is a neck injury. They're being very careful with him there. Well, this is uh, what you say is so true. They're so cautious today about neck injuries, and they have not rolled him over. They haven't moved him off of his stomach. Maybe he did injure his neck, Ken. As he went down, it appeared that he fell on that left shoulder or left arm. But you can see they've got a towel out there. They may be putting that towel around his neck to kind of uh, stabilize it, hold his head in place as they move him. Hopefully that isn't a neck injury. That's one of the worst injuries, and that's, of course, the, that's the thing uh, you fear as a, as a ball player the most, hurting that neck. Well, I think ever since the Daryl Stingley tragedy, people are much more aware of any kind of a a neck injury or anything that has to do with the spine that can cause some problems. I saw Daryl in the Patriots locker room at the end of last season. He comes back every once in a while to meet and talk with some of the former players. And really an inspirational person. He really is. I talked with Daryl uh, briefly after the Miami ball game. It was nice to visit with him. We, of course, recalled a lot of good times. And it's, uh, it's such a tragedy to see a man like him paralyzed. He was just a fabulous, fabulous receiver and athlete and truly uh, a fine person too, Ken. Do you remember the incident vividly? Your own mind? You were I really do. Uh, of course, it was a preseason ball game. We were in Oakland, California playing the Raiders. Darrell came in a slant-in pattern. The ball was overthrown. He dove for the ball and Jack Tatum came in and hit Darrell as he was coming down and Darrell really uh, defenseless in that situation. Brought his head down low in the contact. Of course, uh, breaking his neck, resulting in the paralysis. And you're always, uh, you always just hope when a ball player is down like this, it's nothing serious of that nature. Steve, let's take one more look at what precipitated this. See if we, maybe we can get a little better clue. I think it is the neck problem Okay, here. the ball's overthrown. Your muse tips it. You're going to see Clifford come into your screen to the right. Right there. Now watch how he's going down. Now he's extended his left arm. Down right there. It didn't appear that anyone hit him around the touched. head. No. It looked like maybe he caught that left arm under his body as he fell. Well, that... Uh, Freeman McNeil had the same thing happen to him, but he injured his, he hypertended his elbow. When right, he went right, down Dis situation dislocated like his elbow as he was going down, uh, carrying the ball. He put his arm out to catch himself, and Steve Nelson was coming in from his middle linebacker position. It looked like Steve Nelson, uh, when he 
was coming in on the tackle, made a little contact with McNeil's arm and that elbow popping out. And that's a painful injury. Uh, I've had the hyperextended elbows, but never a dislocated elbow. The ambulance is now working its way onto the field and Clifford will be very carefully removed and taken off for examination and we just again pray that it's nothing serious. The Terriers come off the field. They'll join Steve Stetson on the sideline to talk things over offensively. All of this occurring with 11-13 remaining in the ball game and BU leading 10 to nothing. And they'll have the football and play resumes at the 32 yard line. Just one of those tragic things about football. You never know when the injury is going to come. And of course, you never know how serious it is until a person has taken off. Some of the most serious injuries uh, appear to, to happen on the field. They get to the hospital, no problem. Well, I see Bob Griffin over there. He's concerned. He can well appreciate that type of injury to a, to a ball player who's starting for you, who's been doing a good job. Clifford with some excellent plays today for that Terrier defense. Clifford has had an outstanding day, absolutely. Now, Bob Griffin, really a class guy, Ken. Uh, it's a pleasure to sit down and talk with him. Of course, we had the opportunity to sit with him a couple of weeks ago before the University of Massachusetts ball game here at Kingston. Well, I think uh, life is bigger than football. Pretty well sums up Bob Griffin. And a lot of coaches would crack under the kind of season he's had this year after winning back-to-back -back Yankee Conference titles, but. Bob has maintained his composure and certainly uh, living through it. <laughs> he, he really does keep his perspective. I have a great deal of respect for Bob Griffin. We see there they they have they have him over on his back now. You see they they've got a strap around his chest. He's moving his arms, Ken. That's a good sign. At least he's moving his left arm. It looks as though they may have his right arm in close to his chest. They may have that strapped down, so it may be, it may be that right arm. Well, well, good news, we saw some movement there, right. which indicates uh, no, nothing serious concerning the neck. You'd certainly rather have an arm problem than a neck problem, as you had pointed out. We may be premature in that, but uh, he, was, he was moving an arm. And that's usually an indication that uh, there you can see his, yeah, right there you can see he had his arm up in the air. Now about the case of, uh, this is a good muscle pulling time after you've been standing around and taking a break for 10 minutes. Yeah, just, just cool enough today and especially with that breeze when your, your body's warm if uh, you stop for a while. Go Rooney! That, that damp feeling we have here today maybe sets in there's Steve Stetson pacing the sideline the only touchdown of the game Mancini to Vince Jackson 36 yard touchdown play 7 nothing with 649 remaining in the first or the first half right and then 23 seconds left Dan Green the 25 yard field goal and it's still 10 to nothing now, I'm not sure uh, they reshuffled this defense, as we talked about earlier, Ken. I'm not sure who will take the place of Ken Clifford. It may be number Maybe Jay Tardugno. Yeah, Tardugno, the freshman. Jay Tardungo? Is that right? Yeah. The Tardugno, right. Now, uh, there's, there's an example. The, these teams lacking depth this year. Freshmen and sophomores filling in quite a lot. This is the first game that I've been associated with where an ambulance had to actually come out on the field and take a player away. It's been about a 10 minute delay here. Let's, let's pause and we'll rejoin you for the final 11 minutes and 13 seconds of the ball game. The score BU 10 and Rhode Island nothing. We'll return in a moment. Boston, 1967, was a great year for making a dream come true. For me, it was an opportunity to be a member of a highly spirited team with a determination to win. Today, I belong to another great team, the Jimmy Fund, and I'm calling upon you to join me.
and others as a member of Jimmy's team. To become a member, all you have to do is give what you can and make another dream come true. So come on, join Jimmy's team today. The fastest runners in the United States were my teammates. And to be motivated to run against them every day, knowing that if you were not your very best, that you could stand to lose at any time, was something to behold on a team like uh, the Tiger Bells at Tennessee State University. Athletics played uh, a big part of the decision for me to go to college. Uh, I, as a young girl coming from this very large, wonderful family of 22 children, uh, being the first of the 22 to go to college, it was very important that uh, I get there. I didn't have the slightest idea how we'd go to college because we had no money. But then athletics popped up. Without the athletics, uh, I would not have obtained the education. And without uh, uh, the education part, Back to action now as Mancini sets the ball club following the injury to Clipper. And here's the bomb down to Gadboy. He's got the football at the 20. He'll take it in for the touchdown. Dennis Gadboy completes the bomb and BU strikes big. Well, his teammates congratulating him. And a well-deserved congratulation. Here Mancini on the drop back. Now watch the pump. He gets Adams to commit temporarily. That allows Gadboy to get a step, a perfectly thrown ball. The reception, Anthony Adams misses the tackle as he comes back. Gadboy, the easy touchdown after the catch. Dan Green will try to tack on the extra points, make it 17 to nothing. And does. And with 10.26 remaining in the ball game, BU has taken a 17 to nothing lead on the 56 yard touchdown play from Mancini to Gadboy. All right, that deserves another look. You're gonna see the drop back now. Mancini's gonna pump the ball. Adams, the defender's looking at him. He takes a step in and he tries to make the adjustment as Gadboy breaks down the sideline, perfectly thrown football. Anthony Adams desperately tries to dive and break it up, but Gadboy hauls it in for a big, big score, and that uh, effectively gives them uh, almost a insurmountable lead. Well, the way the Rams are playing so far and not being able to punch it in when they're down there, Steve, 17 points looks mighty big on the scoreboard here. Things have turned sour again for the Rams. Two intercepted passes in the end zone, two roughing the kicker penalties, keeping BU drives alive. A couple of missed field goals all added up to more heartache. Doug Haynes takes the ball on the return, 32-yard line, and he's down there. Well, the Rams have been throwing it all afternoon, but now they've got to throw it again and hope to get some quick points on the board. 10-19 remaining in the ball game. They'll have to put the ball downfield now. Uh, they don't have time to throw a lot of short passes. Look for BU to drop into a three deep zone for the most part at this point. There you see a good shot of Dennis Gadboy. Probably one of the better receivers in the Yankee Conference. Harlan to throw to the left side, Jim Pratt, and he is brought down as he reaches the 41. The drive went two plays, I beg your pardon, five plays, 58 yards, and consumed 47 seconds off the clock. And the 17 to nothing lead. Clock continues to roll. We're under 10 minutes remaining in the ball game. Well, Jim Pratt went out after that tackle that Mark Seals put on him. He was limping, Ken, and he's been replaced in the lineup. Emerson Foster, number 89, is the new wide receiver. 
and he's looking for Foster, and Farland completely overthrows him. I, maybe uh, Foster got a late start out there. Was he hit at the line of scrimmage? He seemed to be slow getting off the line. Well, a little con contact by the corner gave him a little chuck, and it allowed uh, Skip Jackson, who had the deep zone there on the right side, the deep third, actually, they were in that three-deep zone on that play, to get over there. Pat Mancini on the sideline. He's thrown two touchdown passes today. One to Vince Jackson and the last one to Gadboy. See a trace of a smile there. And the pass by Farland is complete to the 47-yard line. And a first down. Well, that gives them the first down, but uh, valuable seconds ticking off that clock. And it looks like your eye is going to go without a huddle here. Jim Muse on the receiving end of that one. 9.25 remaining in the ball game. Rams trailing 17. Farland to throw over the middle. He has Schwab. Steve makes the catch, and he is upended at the 28-yard line and hangs on to the football. Well, this is the kind of play they have to have. They've got to get downfield again. You can see it's like the two-minute drill. They aren't huddling. They're going to come right up on the ball. Now, Farland with a straight drop back. Schwab's going to come from the right side of your screen. There he is running across. Skip Jackson cutting him down as soon as he catches the ball. First and ten as Farland is being chased and will be sacked back at the 43-yard line. Big, big defensive play by McLaughlin. Keith McLaughlin has been sensational on the blitz today, Ken. Great timing hitting the line of scrimmage. Farland never has a chance. He's on top of him immediately as Farland's turning to set up. McLaughlin really doing a nice job on the blitz today. Flew right by Mike Jansen, number 68, who had to try to block two men. And, of course, McLaughlin with the free alley up the middle. Second down, 25. 8.27 left in the game as Farland to throw. Screen pass, Chris Poyer, 45. Picks his way along to the 40 and down to the 38-yard line. Chris Boyer, the 5'10", 186-pound freshman. He was waiting on John Sellinger, his offensive tackle. Sellinger a little late getting out there to help him on that screen. And uh, as we take another look, Farland gets up high there to get the ball, lofts the ball over to him. Now watch, Sellinger comes into your screen. Boyer waiting on Sellinger, finally has to make a move to the outside there, but the pursuit catches up with him. Farland wants to throw down the middle, looking for Jim Mews, picked off. Intercepted at the 30-yard line. Penalty markers come out. There'll be a clip call here to the 35 and out to the 37-yard line. Mike White with the interception. A penalty will come back at the 28, the clip. But BU has the football again. Well, the third interception today for the Terriers, their defense has done a nice job of the turnover. Kevin White, good timing there. Laying back in that zone, cuts in front of Muse, tips the ball momentarily, gets control. Excuse me, I say Kevin White, that's Mike White. Now, right there he cuts back, but there's a clip. One of his teammates clipped one of the Rams. Now, to the wide side of the field right there it looks like he's run out of gas he said oh i'm getting tired <laughs> but nice play by mike white sort of faltering there <laughs> towards the sideline bu first and 10 from the 15 yard line after the walk off following the clip 735 remaining in the ball game terriers lead 17 to nothing mancini says shift guys and he gets the shift back there. And here comes the pitch out to Vince Jackson, who had the 36-yard touchdown catch in the first half. You know, Jackson's so elusive, Ken. Mokay was out there on top of him. Jackson actually ducked underneath Mokay. Of course, Mokay, a very tall defensive end at 6'4", 6'5", and manages to get back for about a one-yard gain. William and Mary has beaten Delaware 24 to 18. That's a final score now. David Below, number 31, is the new fullback in the game, replacing Bunnell, and Jackson is the tailback. Jackson with the pitch. 
tries the left side, but there's a swarm of blue there to greet him. At the 17-yard line, bringing up a third down. <laughs> Mike says, I'm going to enjoy this moment while I've got it. You know, Mike picked that ball off and uh, ended up running the wide side of the field to his right. Ken, I bet he, I bet he ran uh, 80 or 90 yards from the time he caught that ball till he got back to that far right side. He can't do any high fives with his left hand. He's got, he's got it in the cast. It's, uh, it's all padded. Looks like maybe a thumb problem there. That's what it is. You can see that thumb padded up heavily along with the wrist and hand. Third down and six. Mancini wants to throw. Pass complete to Jackson. 25-yard line, 30. <laughs> He's out of bounds at the 29, but he has the first down. Well, Tim Riston, the linebacker, was trying to cover him, and Jackson, with that great speed, gets out there and picks up the first down. As you see Bob Griffin looking on, uh, it's going to be agonizing for Bob. Been a tough season of afternoons for Bob Griffin. Now in his 11th year here at URI, built the program up to the Yankee Conference Championship two years in a row. Now the rebuilding, the retooling, as he calls it. Mancini hands off to Jackson. Mulcahy brings him down at the 31-yard line. 5.52 remaining in the ball game. 17-0. BU is leading. Second down, eight yards to go. Well, Steve Stetson told you earlier this week, Steve, he was not about to give up on this season. He said, no, this is just the doorway to the second half. We're very disappointed after the Richmond ball game two weeks ago. Some but of the cold fans heading for the exits here. Jackson cuts back, still on his feet. Look at this, out to the 37-yard line. He is tough to bring down. Can you, in your own experience, think about a running back that you faced as a pro that had the same shifty moves. It was just so hard for a linebacker to bring down. Well, I do remember a few as we watch it here. The lineman pulling, really not much there. Carbone turns him up inside. Adams comes in, tries to help. People grasping for Jackson. So quick, really quick. Yes, I do. I do remember playing against some backs like that in the pros, Ken. Jackson, 117 yards. Seems like just when you have them, they spin away and pick up extra yardage. Mancini dives for the first down and has it at the 41-yard line. So a big day for Vince Jackson coming in after Randy Pettis cut his hand in the first half. And Jackson with the 36-yard touchdown reception and then now 117 on the ground. I'll tell you who Vince Jackson reminds me of, Ken, who I played against in the pros. Joe Washington. Uh -huh. Played years for the Baltimore Colts and ended up his career with the Washington Redskins. Absolutely started out with Oklahoma. Set all sorts of records down there with the Sooners. First and ten. Gets to Jackson, tries the right side this time, slips a tackle, and out to the 45-yard line. Looked like Kurtz was uh, going to tackle him there. And somehow he gets around him. Outside for more yardage. He's racking up some serious yardage here today. Now has 121 yards. 19 carries. Clock is stopped with 4.07 remaining in the ball game. Second down and six. Mancini sends Ferrara in motion to the near side, and here's the pitch again to Jackson. One, two, three, head to Jackson. And no running room that time. Steve Stetson there on the sidelines. He's going to be happy with what he's seen today, the way his team's performed. And my compliments to Steve Stetson and his staff for their play selection today. It's been extremely good, not only offensively, but defensively calling defenses. They've done a nice job of mixing those calls up. And it looks like scrambling the lineup some, moving people in and out of position has helped today, Steve. And they, those players have responded to that very well. There's Pat Mancini setting the team with 3.26 left in the ballgame. 
Fake pitch, and Mancini wants to throw, and does. It is incomplete. Andy Wise says, hey, I was held up out here, number 82. Perhaps you see him there turning around saying, I was held, but no flag, and a fourth down, an eight. Ken Kurtz from defensive end putting the pressure on Mancini. Steve Jones set to boot the ball away. Stands at his own 30-yard line. Pratt and Poyer are the two deep men at the 25. And the kick. Right down to Poyer at the 26. He's over the 28 out to the 35. And is brought down at the 42-yard line. You don't know how much effect Bob Donfield would have had on the ball game, but certainly the Rams have missed him today at the receiver spot. They've had to go in almost exclusively to Jim Pratt. Although we've seen more of Steve Schwab than we've seen all season, too, and he's done a nice job at his tight end spot. Well, he and Muse have performed well today. New quarterback, the freshman, Paul Galani. And it looks like number 92, Mitchell, in at tight end. On the near side, Mitchell. And Galani wants to throw the football, scrambling. And now will tuck and run and out of bounds at the 45. Galani led Natick High School to a 33-0 record following Doug Flutie and two Super Bowl titles in Massachusetts. Came into the ball game. 33 passes, completing 14, 140 yards, and one touchdown, and rushing six times for 31 yards. There he picks up five. Three minutes left in the ball game. There's the draw play, and no running room for Poyer. Graded immediately. Chris Poyer, another freshman, who broke his arm against Maine last year and had to redshirt. Number 21. So he's getting some of the youngsters an opportunity here, Steve. With well, a 17 nothing deficit. Certainly won't hurt at this point to give them some playing experience. Build, hopefully, towards a depth situation. Galani sacks back the 32-yard line. They're all over it. And that brings up a fourth down. So three quick plays and not much doing there. Well, Tom Lent, number 64, is going to get here. Wrap Galani up. Nice play by Gladka. Haven't uh, his name much today because of the activity of the inside linebackers, but Gladka doing a fine job. And here's the punt. The 50-yard line, it's a shorty. Steve Goodrich. The ball is out of bounds at the 42-yard line. Good thing he got a roll on it. Goodrich, was a, which is uh, his 33rd punt of the season. A minute 47 remaining in the ball game. You see the BU sideline. A little bit of celebrating going on with a 17-0 lead. Next week, we'll watch BU play UMass at Nickerson Field. Terriers up to the line of scrimmage on first down. <laughs> Everybody jumps. We've got a new quarterback in the ball game for UMass, Eric Rosecrans. And nobody seemed to figure out what the count was. Well, you know that the timing on cadence changes when you have a new quarterback. Uh, it happens very often in that situation. New quarterback, his cadence may be off just a fraction of a second compared to the uh, starting quarterback. The offensive linemen aren't used to it. Consequently, you see them jump a little early. Bob Dunfield on the sideline. Frustrating afternoon for Bob with that sore ankle. Can't get into the ball game. He did a hold on the field goal attempt. The bad snap negated that. And good running room by Tony Winston up to the 45-yard line. Gets a good chunk of that back off the penalty. Clock continues to roll with 130 left in the ball game. He looked like Vince Jackson carrying the ball that time. Yeah, absolutely. 
17 to nothing. BU looking at its second win of the season after beating Maine earlier this season. URI 0 and 5 looking at an 0 and 6 start. Long count. Rose Crane's hands off. And Tony Winston up to the 50 yard line. URI off to its worst start in 18 years. 1949. Rams lost all eight of their ball games that year. 42 seconds left in this one. Rose Cranes comes up to the line of scrimmage. New fullback in the ball game, Blaine Applegate. Long count this time as the clock winds to 23 seconds. Winston has the first down, and that'll do it. Nesson's coverage of Hockey East swings back into action tomorrow night. Lowell Chiefs meet the Providence Friars live at 7.30. Check your Nesson listings for other broadcast times. The Friars and the Chiefs, Sunday live, 7.30. Nesson's debut of 1986 Hockey East coverage. With 19 seconds left in this ball game, it's Boston University about to walk off the field with a 17 to nothing win, and Steve Stetson now has something to build on, and Bob Griffin again finds himself going back to the drawing table. Well, Bob Griffin uh, has got to stick in there, hope this team can start overcoming themselves, uh, making those mistakes uh, so frustrating. They get down there, the missed opportunities to convert uh, the field goals, the drop passes, underthrown footballs, Missed blocking assignments, numerous problems the Rams have uh, created for themselves. So they they hopefully uh, they'll get their heads up, working hard. And I know Bob Griffin is the type of guy he's going to demand those ball players keep hustling. Greg Benjamin, number 62, is the injured player on the field. There's Dan Green, the big kicker. He's a big guy. He is a big kicker. He reminds me of UMass's kicker, Dimitri Yavis. Right. Both big fellas. Well, Dan is 6'6", 266 pounds. Benjamin off the field. Well, it's been a long afternoon for the Rams, and again an afternoon, you hate to harp on it, but it's been missed opportunities. The two interceptions, the two roughing the kicker penalties, the fumbles, the penalties. Drop passes, you know, right, right. we've seen it. But let's, let's not overlook the fact, Ken, that this Terrier defense has done a good job today. They've created those turnovers. They've uh, executed well the three interceptions and recovering a couple of fumbles. And that is it as the time runs off the clock and BU celebrates its second victory. There's Bob Griffin, who now faces an 0-6 record to start the season. As the two teams shake hands, the two coaches exchange words in the middle of the field. The final score here from Kingston, Rhode Island, Boston University 17, and Rhode Island. New England College Sports Action continues on Nesson this Monday as the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame travel to Storrs, Connecticut to take on the Yukon Huskies. Tape delayed coverage begins at 8. That's Notre Dame and Yukon Monday right here on Nesson. Our next Yankee Conference football telecast. Next Saturday, UMass Minutemen travel to Nickerson Field in Boston to take on the BU Terriers live at 1.30. That's the UMass Minutemen and the BU Terriers next Saturday live 1.30 on Nesson, where we deliver. The executive producer of New England College Sports on Nesson is Bob Whitelaw. Today's game, produced and directed by Ed Flacey. And our coordinating producer, John Vasala. Football 86 has been an exclusive presentation of Nesson, your New England Sports Network, where we deliver. <laughs>